government is working for them and that it's on their side. That's the government I promise. That's the government I intend to lead. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. Why are you not signing this bill in public? Now a hearing on how the Treasury Department is using tax dollars to try to stabilize the financial markets. Witnesses include Assistant Treasury Secretary Neil Kashkari, the official in charge of the program known as TARP. Dennis Kucinich chairs the Oversight Subcommittee on Domestic Policy. This is a portion of the hearing. Good morning. This is the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of Oversight and Government Reform. I am Congressman Dennis Kucinich, Chairman of the Committee. The subject of today's committee hearing is entitled Peeling Back the Tarp exposing Treasury's failure to monitor the ways financial institutions are using taxpayer funds provided under the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Our first witness today will be Mr. Neil Kashkari, the Acting Interim Assistant Secretary for Financial Stabilization, the Department of Treasury. Uh, we are joined today by a number of members uh, of Congress and uh, including uh, the new ranking member, uh, Mr. Jim Jordan of Ohio. And I want to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Jordan to uh, this uh, position on the subcommittee. And I want to let you know, uh, sir, that I'm looking forward to uh, working with you. It's very interesting in this subcommittee we have uh, uh, an Ohio connection, not only Mr. Jordan, but Mr. Issa is originally from Ohio. Uh, Mr. Turner's from Ohio. Ohio is well represented in this. Uh, our witness is from Ohio. And, and our witness is from Ohio. So I, I suppose uh, this is Buckeye Day on Capitol Hill. Um, we're going to um, we're going to begin with uh, an opening statement. I want to thank Mr. Cummings uh, uh, for being here, as, as well as uh, the, the gentleman from Vermont, uh, Mr. Welch, and uh, the witness with unanimous consent, uh, the uh, witness, Mr. Kashkari, uh, when we get to his testimony, is going to be given 10 minutes. Uh, he may not need it all, but given uh, the gravity of this subject, he's going to be given uh, 10 minutes to uh, make his opening statement uh, without objection. The Troubled Assets Relief Program has provided about $200 billion in capital injections to hundreds of banks. The money was provided with virtually no strings attached. Most of the banks didn't even bother to account separately for the federal monies. It's debatable whether the efforts of those that did amount to anything meaningful. Treasury does not even ask TARP recipients for a detailed accounting of their use of TARP funds. Because some of the banks are multinational banks, the kinds of transactions they are doing include billions in loans and investments in other countries at precisely the time that a liquidity shortage has impaired credit markets in the U.S. and a recession deeper than anything seen since the Great Depression is impairing production and employment. Nevertheless, several very large transactions conducted after these banks receive billions in a taxpayer-funded bailout include an $8 billion of financing arranged by Citigroup for public authorities in Dubai, a $7 billion investment by Bank of America in the China Construction Company, a $1 billion investment by a J.P. Morgan subsidiary in expanding operations in India. Unfortunately, the legislation Congress passed creating the TARP required very little of the recipients to receive taxpayer-funded subsidies. The Treasury regulations and contracts crafted to implement the TARP did not require much of anything other than someone signed for the money. It may be argued that transactions such as these are beneficial to the balance sheets of the banks that are making them, that they have some indirect benefit to the U.S. financial system as a whole. Really. If the banking system is in serious enough trouble to require massive amounts of federal support, shouldn't that federal support 
be directed and channeled to the domestic economy? Or are these examples of large investments and loans to foreign entities among the kind of transactions the American taxpayers should be supporting with TARP monies when we face significant credit problems here at home? How does a multi-billion dollar financing deal to Dubai ease the liquidity crisis in the United States of America? What about other kinds of uses of funds? Corporate spending on lavish parties, the continuation of contractual agreements to pay for naming rights on professional sports stadiums, corporate sporting event sponsor sponsorships. Is this what the taxpayers expect our government to do with TARP funds? Is this what Congress intended? If it was the business judgment of the very same bankers in charge that governed their decisions before the financial crisis and arguably helped create the crisis, is it tolerable to continue to defer to that judgment and allow them to spend taxpayers' money with no explanation, little accountability, and no questions asked? Under the precedent set by former Secretary Paulson, the Paulson TARP program makes no demand on TARP recipients for detailed information about their spending. Even though the statute obligates Treasury to be able to prevent waste and abuse of TARP monies, Mr. Paulson's Treasury Department did not even bother to set standards for waste and abuse of TARP funds. Trust them is essentially what seems to pass for oversight of the capital purchase plan. Treasury has no concrete idea of how TARP monies are being used. They don't ask questions of TARP recipients about their use of funds and don't gather sufficiently detailed information from TARP recipients to know what to ask about. The problem is not a lack of authority. Under the agreements between Treasury and the TARP recipient financial institutions, Treasury has broad contractual authority to scour company books in search of, among other things, waste and abuse by TARP recipients. But in practice, Treasury is not doing so. The serious shortcomings in the creation and implementation of the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, namely the absence of definitions of waste and abuse or explicit conditions for the use of TARP funds, resulted in the inescapable conclusion that Treasury's oversight will not find waste, fraud, or abuse because it isn't looking for it. Now, to read Mr. Kashgari's testimony today, we find nothing to contradict that conclusion, with all due respect. In fact, Mr. Kashgari was asked to testify on the steps that Treasury has taken to detect and prevent the waste of TARP monies. Mr. Kashgari's testimony does not address that question. Rather, he describes Treasury's efforts to do something else, to determine the impact of TARP monies on the bank's lending activity. Treasury has submitted 90 pages, 90 pages of uh, intermediation snapshots from the largest 20 TARP recipients. But what does that prove? Perhaps very little. There are significant shortcomings to Treasury's reliance on the monthly intermediation snapshots. First, only the 20 largest TARP recipients report anything at all. Obviously, there can be little monitoring of the impact of TARP monies on the credit activities of the 297 TARP recipients, which do not file monthly intermediation snapshots. Second, the snapshots do not provide details about any individual transaction, no matter how significant. Third, these snapshots address the lending side, the lending side of the recipient's business. They do not address any other investment or expenditure. And fourth, and importantly, they address only new lending and not the contraction of existing lending in the form of foreclosures and elimination of credit lines. If the amount of new lending does not more than make up for the amount of lending contracted and that's through foreclosures, decreasing credit limits, calling back loans, then the net amount of credit in the economy is shrinking. <laughs> telling one side of the credit story without telling the other does not give us a fair and balanced view of the realities small businesses and individuals know so well. At best, the snapshots might serve the purpose of monitoring at the most general level some impact TARP funds may be having on certain new lending activities, but they don't reflect the net impact of contracting credit activities on existing borrowers. 
and they tell us nothing about the use of TARP funds, which is the focus of this hearing. Unfortunately, Mr. Kashgari's testimony is not responsive to the purpose of this hearing outlined specifically in, in the letter of invitation sent to him on February 25th. And Mr. Kashgari's silence on the subject of this hearing speaks volumes. The inescapable conclusion is that Treasury is not conducting oversight of the TARP monies dispersed through the Capital Assets Purchase Program to prevent wasteful or abusive use of hundreds of billions of dollars in taxpayers' funds. Perks for company management were considered sound business judgment before the financial crisis and taxpayer bailout, and they're considered sound business judgment now using taxpayers' money. Loans to foreign governmental authorities were considered sound business judgment before the crisis and bailout, and they're supposedly sound business judgment now using taxpayers' money. Investments in foreign company operations, even if it results in more layoffs in the United States, were sound business judgments before, and they're sound business judgments now using taxpayers' money. In its current form, the Capital Purchase Program of TARP leaves recipient companies free to use federal funds as they would any other source of income before the crisis and before taxpayers provided the bailout. Treasury's development of the TARP program generally and the Capital Purchase Program specifically has introduced no new transparency or accountability that did not exist before taxpayers were given the bill for cleaning up the mess. It has perpetuated business as usual. It defers to the so-called sound business judgment, judgment of the same corporate management in many cases that led to the crisis we're embroiled in now. TARP was developed under the previous Secretary of the Treasury. Nearly every observation that will be made today originates on his watch. But if the new administration is to avoid perpetuating the approach of the past, real change is going to have to be necessary. It should start with the collection of detailed information about how TARP recipients are using taxpayer funds and the imposition of conditions and standards for how they may use the monies taxpayers have provided and may be called upon to provide in the future. Uh, my colleagues on this committee, with news reports projecting that at least another $2 trillion Another $2 trillion will be requested of taxpayers. It is my hope that this hearing today will help propel the new Department of Treasury to, do, to reform the intolerable deficiencies of the TARP program, thereby making recipients accountable to the public for the use of taxpayer funds. Finally, we owe it to the American taxpayers to provide a complete, comprehensive accounting of all TARP funds that have already been allocated. And after such a thorough accounting is made available, then let the people decide if their hard-earned tax dollars are being spent wisely and in the best interest of the American economy and the best interest of the United States of America. I yield now to uh, the ranking member, Mr. Jordan of Ohio. I thank the chairman. And I will be brief. Uh, our, um, our ranking member, Congressman Issa, will provide our opening statement. We were in I was in the Judiciary Committee yesterday, and I think there were 15 opening statements, so we don't need two from our side. But I did want to say to the, to the Chairman, I look forward to working with you in this committee. Uh, since the first time we met, I think, at an orientation session at the Ohio General Assembly in 1994, I have um, always appreciated the Chairman's passion and intensity that, uh, that he brings to the legislative process. So I do look forward to uh, working with you, this Congress, and, and this committee. And with that, I'll turn over to our, uh, our ranking member. I, I, I thank the gentleman. I just want to say that uh, Mr. Jordan's a uh, champion wrestler, and I look forward to working with you as well. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this uh, extremely important hearing. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Kashkari, welcome. Uh, it's, it's not easy for us to hold a hearing on the, uh, the TARP, the Troubled Asset uh, Relief Program, or as some people think it's called, the Toxic Asset Relief Program, because the TARP suffers from a lack of transparency and accountability. Uh, in our previous hearing, uh, we asked questions such as, how much have you spent? Where, where is the money? What is it worth today? Uh, but as of February 6th, uh, <clears throat> the Treasury Department has uh, verified that $300 billion in taxpayers' funds uh, have been uh, provided to our nation's financial institutions in the form of preferred shares, warrants, loans, and insurances against loss. Now, that figure, of course, is outdated today, and we hope to hear an update. 
Well, the uh, Department of Tre <coughs> well, the Treasury Department currently monitors aggregate monthly levels of some banking activities. It does not require any recipient of TARP funds to disclose the details of any individual transaction that the recipient would not have entered into but for the TARP money. In other words, we do not know if $300 billion of taxpayers' money has changed the, anyone's behavior. As a result, neither the, Depart the Treasury Department nor Congress nor the general public truly knows the outcome achieved by injecting taxpayers' money. Mr. Chairman, this lack of transparency simply is unacceptable. We can certainly make the case that this level of transparency and the need for it may not have been anticipated prior to September of last year. Uh, but a government of the future must be designed for transparency. We must ensure that all of our institutions, whether receiving federal funds or simply operating on an interstate basis, be in fact prepared to provide transparency. That means interoperable systems and databases. Uh, <clears throat> we must understand, however, that true transparency re re requires attention not only to what information is disclosed, but to how the information is disclosed. To il illustrate this principle, consider that we uh, receive a del deluge of information from the SEC in, in the form of 10-Ks and other documents. As a matter of fact, my understanding is that there are about 15 million pages of text. If that is simply text, and in order to figure out the state of the top 200 or so companies in America, you would have to go through 10 or more million pages of documents, then that information, in fact, is not information. It is simply pages of text. Good luck sifting through it. In this day and age, every American uh, understands that if they don't do it themselves, they could download from their bank or other financial institution a monthly statement, receive it online, import it into Quicken into a spreadsheet, into some other uh, accounting system, home accounting system, so they could quickly look at their financial statements, keep track of them from month to month, and, and do analysis of the trends in their own investments. So knowing that you can do this on a personal basis, one would ask, what can we do on a national basis? The answer is, without the pro a promising technology such as XBRL that can standardize all financial reporting for easy accessibility, we will not be able to do the same on a global basis. More than 40 countries have already adopted this standard, including China. The United States is currently uh, requiring the disclosure of information to the FDIC in XBRL format. However, the SEC has been slow to act, took most of last year to consider it, and only recently has approved a final rule that will mandate XBRL for all public company reporting, uh, with, some, with some companies required to comply starting in June of 2009. Continuing with XBR technology, it is clear to the public that when we talk about lettered technologies and, uh, uh, and call them technologies, that they may ask, is this difficult? I am going to say here today that although we will receive extensive information uh, later today, it is not difficult. It is simply the Federal Government requiring that financial institutions, those providing mortgages into the public market, those operating with the public trust such as public corporations, and those receiving TARP money, provide information in a way that we do not have to remassage it, that it is transparent to a computer. They still have the right, using this technology, to withhold information or to be assured that the government will keep confidential information confidential. But only with this sort of a common format can we, in fact, begin to separate what is often called toxic assets, which, in fact, is good act assets mixed with bad with no ability to decide which is which. Without it, we are back to where we were before September. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I absolutely look forward to Mr. Kashkari's answers on what he can see today, what he knows today, but more importantly for both the first and second panel, I am desperate and America is desperate to ensure that we do not come back to a hearing three, four, five months from now and find out that we still don't know where the money went. We still cannot quickly decide what assets are good and what assets are bad. 
Lastly, Mr. Chairman, I believe that when we look at the problem, and Mr. Kashkari has been looking at this in a, a huge way, America had a, a debt level of about 300 percent of GDP, or about $45 trillion plus or minus of debt. Historically, America ran 100 to 120 percent of debt uh, to GDP, meaning 15, maybe 20 trillion dollars of debt. The unwinding of this debt, even with the trillions of dollars that are either pledged or the hundreds of billions of dollars that have been delivered, still has a long way to go. I look forward to hearing from Mr. Kashkari how they plan to find the stabilized level of debt that America should be. I believe that whether it is the international institutions that have gone on business as usual, as the Chairman said, providing dollars to foreign investors or it is our domestic spending, that we have to come to grips with how much of the contraction was appropriate because of an excess, an excess that we all found uh, interesting and valuable, but in fact didn't realize that when it unwound was inevitably going to uh, give us uh, huge problems. For example, if in fact our 100, 100 to 120 percent of GDP is not the, the new norm, but rather 200 percent of GDP is a new norm, we still have a 15 trillion or so dollar contraction of debt that will be permanent. I know that is not the subject for today, but it is a subject that I look forward to people at Treasury and others working with economists to discover, because we have to decide what portion of America, America's hard-earned money is going to be put into stimuluses, TARPs and others, and how much, in fact, is going to have to be written off to we can't go back to the roaring 20s and we can't go back to the roaring aughts, if you will. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence. I look forward to this hearing and yield back. Well, I want to thank uh, Mr. Issa, who is the ranking member of the full committee, uh, for his participation, and I think that all members would agree that uh, Mr. Rice's business acumen uh, brings a real strength to our uh, deliberations, not only today, but uh, uh, always. So thank you, sir. Uh, it is my honor now to introduce the chairman of the full committee, who is our, our new chairman, and who's, uh, under whose uh, guidance we uh, helped to craft uh, today's hearing, and under whose uh, uh, guidance we will go even deeper into the workings of this uh, TARP program, as well as the broad range of government oversight and reform issues facing the United States Congress and America. At this time, it is my honor to introduce the distinguished gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Towns, the chairman of the full committee. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Kucinich, um, the uh, chair of the uh, subcommittee and, of course, Ranking Member Jordan, uh, for convening this hearing. Oversight of the Treasury's TARP program is an important topic for this committee. And I am pleased that Mr. Kashkari is here today to update us on the program. It is quite clear to me at this point that Treasury does not have the information or personnel in place to conduct vigorous oversight of the TARP program, and that bothers me. The information we have received about the types of data the government is tracking are far too vague to develop measures of the program's effectiveness. I am afraid we are reaching a point where Treasury just does not know what Wall Street is doing with government funds. In fact, I don't think they even know how much they don't know. In my view, Congress has been ex extraordinarily generous in allowing the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve a latitude in dealing with the current financial crisis. However, the Federal Government's unprecedented investment of billions of dollars demands further scrutiny. I am particularly concerned about AIG. To date, the Government has invested $160 billion, that is B as in boy, in AIG, and stated last week that AIG may require further support. It should come as no surprise that Congress has expressed the need to know exactly how this money has been spent, on what basis it has been spent, and exactly who are the beneficiaries of this record Federal subsidy. But we cannot take it on blind faith 
that federal financial support of AIG or other firms is being carried out in a sensible manner. We just can't take that. This hearing should tell us what information Treasury is collecting and what information is being shared with the Congress and what information is completely unknown to anyone responsible to the American taxpayers. I hope we can come out of this hearing with a plan for obtaining the information necessary to make responsible decisions about our economy and the burden that the American people are bearing to bail out Wall Street. Let me just say, this is not a one-shot deal. We're not going to go away. We owe it to the taxpayers. Mr. Chairman, on that note, I yield back. I, I thank the uh, Chairman of the Full Committee, and it's an honor to serve with you. Um, at, at this time, of course, uh, all uh, members of this committee, uh, without objection, are going to have five minutes for an opening statement. Any other member who seeks recognition, Mr. Souter of Indiana, do you uh, desire to have an opening statement? Uh, Mr. Cummings of uh, Maryland. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to thank you, and I want to thank uh, a chairman of the full committee for and uh, ranking for making this hearing happen here and take place. Um, you know, I was just sitting here just thinking about our last hearing, and during that hearing, Mr. Kashkari uh, presented, and there were some issues that we brought up that he um, did not know about. And I realize that there's a lot to get your arms around. I, I understand that. But I want us to, I want us to, the reason why this hearing is so important is that we are in probably one of the worst economic circumstances that we have been in in our lifetimes. And I do believe that President Obama is doing everything in his power, along with Treasury Secretary Geithner, to straighten up this mess. And it is just that. The problem is that uh, unless there is transparency and unless there is accountability, it's going to be impossible to maintain the trust of the public, and we need the public trust. Right now, the people in my district are losing their savings, their homes, and as a matter of fact, I was at a town hall meeting the other day, Mr. Chairman, and a gentleman said to me, he said, you know what, I stopped looking at my statement because I'm afraid to look at it. It will put me in a bad mood for the next month or so, so I don't even look at it anymore. And so they're, and they're losing their jobs. And at the same time, they turn around and they hear uh, about uh, the AIGs of the world, and they hear about the city groups, the abuses of this money. And you know what they ask themselves, the question? The question they ask is, why is my tax dollar being used in this way? But then the thing I think that really alarms them is when they hear the oversight panel uh, in its recent report uh, write, say, uh, and I quote, the panel still does not know what uh, the banks are doing with the taxpayers' money. It's going to be very difficult for the President and for Secretary Geithner to turn this ship around unless we have a situation where there is that transparency and the accountability. But if you don't know, if you don't know what's going on, that's a real problem. And so we found out just recently that AIG was given retention bonus, bonus, uh, payments. Now, these, these retention payments were supposed to be to retain people, but these were the very people that they were letting go. There's also something else that's happening here, Mr. Chairman, and there is an arrogance uh, on the part of some of these company executives with regard to the American taxpayers' dollars. And, and so I'm hoping that, in, in the words of Mr. Towns, that we'll be able to come up with Chairman Towns the, 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 a plan to address this. But the question also becomes is do we have, does the Treasury Secretary have enough authority to do the things that he needs to do? And I'm hoping that those questions will be answered today. And so I look forward to the testimony of Mr. Kashkari and the other uh, witnesses, and uh, again, I thank you all for uh, calling this hearing. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummings. The chair recognizes Mr. Fortenberry of Nebraska. 
Well, just briefly, Mr. Chairman, let me thank you for the opportunity to join you on this subcommittee. I think it is a critical subcommittee for the well-being of um, <clears throat> overview of public policy in this country. But uh, also, for, I wanted to commend you for, thank, for picking this particular topic as the um, one that clearly sets a priority for the tenor and the paradigm of this committee. Uh, clearly, people want to know uh, where their money is going to. And, Mr. Chairman, if I could offer this, I think it is very important to review back when the taxpayers were asked to, to bail out uh, financial institutions in the name of uh, resetting the economy, stabilizing the economy. There was a question floating around or the suggestion that these institutions were too big to fail. Uh, I think we should be asking, are they too big to succeed? One of the real problems that we have in this country is financial consolidation, the liberalized credit system that brought about uh, the use of exotic financial instruments, as well as um, what seems to be reckless behavior. So I'm hopeful that this subcommittee and this particular hearing uh, delves deeply into this issue to at least answer one question as to where the, the money is going, and then secondly, if this is an appropriate investment. Uh, I, I want to uh, thank uh, our new committee member, Mr. Uh, Fortenberry of Nebraska, for his presence on the subcommittee and also for his observation. Uh, the question that you pose about uh, whether or not a company is uh, too big to fail and your further question about the issue of consolidation in the economy and its effect on the economy is something that is a proper subject for this uh, domestic policy subcommittee. So with the cooperation of our chairman, Mr. Towns, uh, we would uh, look forward to delving deeply into that issue. Yeah, I appreciate your comments, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Welch uh, of Vermont for uh, his opening. <coughs> uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there does seem to be clear unanimity here about the absolute uh, requirement that there be full accountability. And I want to focus attention on uh, one specific area. Uh, we've used a lot of money from TARP and other programs for AIG, and there's going to be another $30 billion that already has been authorized with no additional requirement that AIG disclose to us how specifically that money is used. And this new use of uh, TARP funds is a significant departure from previous TARP assistance to AIG, and as long as it continues to be given without requiring AIG to fully disclose how that money is being spent, it's going to thwart our efforts to provide answers to the American taxpayer. AIG has been unwilling so far to provide significant information on what financial institutions, either domestic or foreign, are counterparties, the counterparties to its outstanding credit default swaps. That's why, for example, we still don't know who received much of the money that the Federal Reserve gave to AIG. I think we're all in agreement. The taxpayers are entitled to know how their money is being spent. And what I'd like to know on behalf of the American taxpayer is basically this. One, does Treasury agree that AIG can use this money to fulfill credit default swap obligations with taxpayer money from TARP? Uh, two, if so, does Treasury have a specific plan to track each and every dollar that AIG uses to pay counterparties? And three, what plans does Treasury have to compel AIG to release information to Treasury and the American taxpayer on what counterparties are paid? Keep in mind, AIG is 80 percent taxpayer owned, so in a way, AIG is us. Now, the justification, of course, for giving any aid to AIG uh, is the systemic risk that Treasury and the Fed have concluded exists if we let it go under. It's one thing, however, if that systemic risk and the funds that are transferred are used to protect uh, American, average Americans who have annuities uh, and insurance policies with AIG, it's quite another if that money is being used basically uh, to hedge the bets and reward uh, speculators, investment uh, banks, uh, hedge funds that simply bet wrong on some of these cr credit default swaps. So. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my question really goes to getting specific information on how money is being used to pay counterparties and what counterparties are on the receiving end of this benefit. And I yield back. Uh, I want to thank the gentleman for his opening statement and uh, uh, to compliment it uh, to introduce into the record 
uh, an article in yesterday's Washington Post by David M. Smith called Tim Geithner's Black Hole, which uh, discusses directly the point that you raised about uh, AIG and the credit default swaps. So I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, a, a former chair of uh, the Government Oversight Committee, uh, Mr. Burton of Indiana. Thank you for being here, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this hearing. You look the same uh, in person as you do on TV. <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, Mr. Kashkari, uh, I don't think there's a member of Congress that really knows where all this money has gone. And I think that's one of the biggest problems we have is, is we, we go back to our constituents and they say, well, where are you spending all this money? And we can't, uh, we can't give them an answer. And we say, well, you just have to trust Mr. Kashkari and, and uh, the Secretary of the Treasury and, 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 and it will get done. Today I see here that $8 billion of the loan that was, uh, of, the, of the TARP money that was given to Citigroup went to Dubai, a billion uh, by J.P. Morgan Treasury Services. Uh, it was used in development of cash management and trade finances, finance solutions in India, $7 billion investment by Bank of America and China Construction Bank Corporation. Uh, and, and we need to have a, a complete rundown or as complete as possible so we can explain to our constituents why we're doing this and what the end result is going to be. And we, don't, we can't do that right now. And we're supposed to grant you and, and other members of the administration the funds that are necessary to get this economy moving. And for us to be able to do that, we need to be able to convince our constituents that it's the right thing to do. And we can't do that right now. I mean, the people back home are madder than hell about what's going on. And they need to have the facts, you know. The other thing is uh, currently uh, only the largest 20 recipients of TARP CP funds are required to file reports of any type with TARP overseers. The other 297 financial institutions do not. I think that should be much broader. I think that there should be a, a, a report that uh, uh, goes to the TARP overseers but also to the Congress of the United States. You're going to have a much easier time when you come up here, uh, Mr. Kashkari, if we have the facts so that we can go back home and at least make the case that this government's doing the right thing. Every time I go home, people say, my gosh, you spent $700 billion on TARP, you spent $787 billion on the stimulus package, you spent $408 billion or $10 billion yesterday. I mean, we're talking about trillions of dollars. And then Geithner over Treasury says he's going to have to put 2 or $3 trillion into the financial institutions to get them up and running the way they should. And we all want the economy to flourish, but we have to have the facts. And I really hope you'll take this to heart. I know that you hear all this stuff and you say, oh, my gosh, I wish these guys had never shut up. But if you want to have the American people to be supportive, we have to have the facts. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back to balance my time. I, I want to thank the gentleman from Indiana. And I just want to say in support of your statement, I have here uh, a uh, news release from Citigroup with a headline, City arranges more than $8 billion for Dubai. Uh, they received $25 billion in bailout funds on, I believe it was October 26th. And this news release is dated December 14, 2008. Without objection, this will be submitted to the record. Uh, the chair recognizes, uh, I, I think, is Mr. Kennedy is next. Uh, Mr. Yes. Kennedy from Rhode Island, thank you for being here, and you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And following up uh, the, ch the former chairman from Indiana about uh, Dubai, um, Bank of America sent $7 billion to China, China Construction Bank Corporation after it received funds from U.S. tax dollars, Mr. Chairman. I mean, uh, I think the frustration that we all have here, and I heard it from my constituents last week, was that they're prepared, as one of my constituents said, we're prepared to uh, take our medicine. We want to make sure we take it the same as everybody else. And they don't see themselves as taking their medicine the same as everybody else. They see us aggregating the profits of the very wealthy in this country and socializing the loss of the middle class in this mess that we have here. They see their tax dollars going to pay off those who have savings, those who have dividends, those who have made out the best in the 80s and 90s during this great uh, 
wealth that has been made and accrued over the last several decades, while they, the people who are the wage earners in this country, the people that don't have savings, the people who are paying payroll taxes, are bailing out the very wealthiest in this country. There's something inherently wrong in this picture. And they are not about to have the wealthiest in this country be the only ones with a voice down here. And what's inherently wrong here is that we're aggregating the profits and socializing the losses, and that we're not making sure that the, the medicine is shared equally amongst all the American people in terms of how we're making sure that we're all getting back on track evenly here. And that, I think, Mr. Chairman, is what we need to get about doing so that we're not making sure that uh, just a few of the people, the American people, are the ones who are left paying the bill here and letting all these others get off scot-free. Uh, I want to thank the gentleman from Rhode Island and thank him for uh, being on the subcommittee. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Watson. I want to join with my colleagues in thanking you for holding today's hearing. The Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008 authorized the TARP program for the dispersal of $700 billion of taxpayers' money in two tranches to attempt to restore liquidity and stability to the financial system. To date, the Treasury Department has committed approximately $299.6 billion to the TARP funds to participating financial institutions. With nearly half of the allocated TARP money drawn down and an economy which continues to shed jobs and capital daily, it is crucial that today's hearing gives us an honest perspective on the Treasury Department's efforts to regulate the use of TARP funds and insight into how to guarantee that these funds are effectively spent in a manner that maximizes the eventual over to returns to taxpayers, while increasing liquidity to our banking system is a key consideration for the Treasury Department in orchestrating and distributing the TARP funds. It is also a legally mandated responsibility of the Treasury Department to maintain internal control of these funds to prevent waste and abuse of the taxpayers' money. The current global economy crisis is a result of a systemic unwillingness on behalf of institutions and individuals at all levels to routinely self-examine their financial practices to verify that they are responsible and sustainable in the long run. Now, as we continue to implement an unprecedented reorientation of the relationship between business and government, it is critical that we apply this lesson to the actions of the Treasury Department and to all of the TARP recipient institutions. And, Mr. Chairman, I would particularly like to thank each of today's panelists for cooperating with this committee, and I sincerely hope that the testimony we hear today will provide us with a detailed assessment of the ways institutions have utilized their TARP funds and the ability of the Treasury Department to oversee the transactions. When we go home to our districts, as other members have described, we get inundated with telephone calls and personal visits. What is going on? When can I lower my mortgage payment? When can I have the interest lowered? What are you doing? And these angry calls are constant. So I would like to take back information when I go back to the district tomorrow, based on what we hear from the witnesses that will address their concerns. So uh, I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for this very significant hearing today. I yield back. And I, th I thank the gentlelady for her uh, constant participation in, in these subcommittee meetings. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Tierney of Massachusetts. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm prepared to go to the witness when we can. Thank you. Okay. I, I thank the, the gentleman for his uh, presence here. 
Uh, it, uh, if there's no other member of uh, Congress or of this committee who's uh, ready to proceed, uh, we're going to now move to introducing our first panel. Mr. Neil Kashkari was designated as the Acting Interim Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Financial Stability on October 6, 2008. He was asked by the new administration, the Obama administration, to stay on for the sake of continuity and continues to serve in a difficult role during this transition. In this capacity, Mr. Kashkari heads the Office of Financial Stability, which oversees the Troubled Asset Relief Program. He is also the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for International Economics and Development. Mr. Kashkari joined the Treasury Department in July 2006 as Senior Advisor to U.S. Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson, Jr. In that role, he was responsible for developing and executing the Department's response to the housing crisis, including the formation of the Hope Now Alliance, the development of the subprime fast-track loan modification plan, and the Treasury's initiative to kickstart a covered bond market in the United States. Prior to joining the Treasury Department, Mr. Kashkari was a Vice President at Goldman Sachs & Company in San Francisco. Mr. Kashkari, I want to thank you for being uh, before this subcommittee today. I know I speak for all the members in saying that. And uh, we're looking forward to your testimony. As you know, it is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that uh, the gentleman answered in the affirmative. I will, uh, we've already, at the beginning of this hearing, I had a unanimous consent for Mr. Kashkari uh, to uh, have uh, 10 minutes if he, if he needs it, up to 10 minutes if you need it, sir, uh, so that uh, you will uh, have sufficient time uh, to make your statement. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Towns, uh, Ranking Member, excuse me, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Jordan, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. As you know, uh, I was appointed by the prior administration, and the Obama administration asked me to remain at Treasury for a brief period to help with the transition. I am honored to provide whatever help I can to the new administration. The American people provided Treasury with broad authorities under the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act to stabilize the financial system, and it is essential we communicate our actions in a clear and transparent manner to maintain their trust. Today, I will briefly review the actions Treasury has taken to stabilize the financial system and describe the steps we are taking to monitor the activities of recipients of government capital. Many years in the making, the credit crisis erupted during the summer of 2007. Last year, the crisis intensified and our major financial institutions came under severe pressure from deteriorating market conditions and financial institutions failed. In March, Bear Stearns. In July, IndyMac. In September, we witnessed the conservatorship of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the rescue of AIG, the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, the distressed sale of Wachovia, and the failure of Washington Mutual. Eight major U.S. financial institutions effectively failed in six months, six of them in September alone. This stress was reflected in something called the LIBOR OIS spread. It's a key measure of risk in the financial system. Typically, five to 10 basis points. On September 1, the one month spread was 47 basis points. By the 18th, when Treasury and the Fed went to the Congress, the spread had climbed to 135 basis points. By the time the bill passed, just two weeks later, the spread had nearly doubled again to 263 basis points. Credit markets continued to deteriorate, and the spread just one week later spiked to 338 basis points, almost 50 times normal levels. Our nation was faced with the potential imminent collapse of our financial system. 
So many people ask me, what if the financial system had collapsed? Businesses of all sizes might not have been able to access funds to pay their employees, who then wouldn't have money to pay their bills. Families might not have been able to access their retirement funds. Basic financial services might have been disrupted. The severe economic contraction and large job losses we are now experiencing were triggered by the credit crisis. However, had the financial system collapsed, this recession, including terrible job losses and numerous foreclosures, could have been far, far more severe. Now, a program as large and complex as the TARP would normally take many months or even years to establish. But we didn't have months or years. We moved as quickly as possible to implement programs to rapidly stabilize the system and prevent collapse. In the 159 days since Congress passed the law, we have successfully implemented the Capital Purchase Program, having now invested in 489 institutions in 47 states and Puerto Rico, 489 banks in 47 states, with approximately 30 new investments each week. The median investment is $16 million. The vast majority of these institutions are banks in our communities. Treasury also helped the Federal Reserve establish a lending program to reduce borrowing costs for consumers, including auto loans, student loans, credit cards, small business loans, and that will begin funding this month. We are planning to expand this lending initiative to include other asset classes, such as commercial mortgage-backed securities. Under Secretary Geithner's new financial stability plan, Treasury, Treasury also announced a new capital assistance program and launched a multi-part housing program to reduce borrowing costs and to encourage long-term sustainable loan modifications. Finally, we are developing a public-private investment fund to purchase illiquid assets from banks also to support new lending. Now, during this time, Treasury has unfortunately had to step in to stabilize several large institutions whose failures would pose a systemic risk to our financial system and to our economy. We regretted having to take these actions, to put so many taxpayer dollars at risk to support firms that had made bad decisions. But our choice was clear. When the consequences of inaction so severe and the potential cost to the taxpayers of inaction so much greater than the cost of intervention. Today, that LIBOR OIS spread, which had peaked at 338 basis points, has now fallen to 34 basis points. We believe the combined actions of Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC have prevented a financial collapse, but we still have much more work to do to get credit flowing to our communities. Now, in terms of monitoring, in January, Treasury began collecting data from the 20 largest recipients of capital under the CPP, representing almost 90 percent of the capital deployed under that program. Mr. We Chairman, uh, could I just interrupt just for a second here? Not uh, okay. customary to interrupt a witness, so I'd, unless it's something urgent, I'd prefer that Mr. Kashgari would proceed with his statement. Th thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, we published our first monthly lending survey in February. This survey shows bank by bank, the lending and intermediation activities of institutions by category, such as consumer, commercial, and real estate loans. This survey is published monthly on Treasury's website. Now, in recessions, credit levels typically fall as both borrowers and lenders become more cautious. The first survey shows that lending held up remarkably well despite one of the most severe quarterly economic contractions in recent decades. Without capital from Treasury, those lending levels would likely have been much lower. And we are also developing a narrower survey for smaller institutions that receive government capital to monitor their lending monthly. So we will be surveying all institutions. And the new CAP program that Secretary Geithner has announced will also require institutions to indicate their expected use of funds and increase and track lending against a baseline so we can monitor that. Now, with investments in almost 500 institutions and hundreds more in the pipeline, 
We must ensure that our investments are targeted at stabilizing the economy, but we must also take great care not to try to micromanage recipient institutions. However well intended, government officials are not positioned to make better commercial decisions than lenders in our communities. The government must not attempt to force banks to make loans they are not comfortable with, nor should we try to direct the lending from Washington. Bad lending practices were at the root cause of this crisis, and returning to those practices will not help end the turmoil. The ESA was one of several initiatives taken by the federal government to stabilize the financial system, an absolutely necessary precondition to economic recovery. We believe the combined actions of Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC have helped prevent a financial collapse. Nonetheless, the current crisis took years to build up and will take time to work through, and we still face real economic challenges. There is no single action the federal government can take to end the financial market turmoil and end the economic downturn, but the authorities Congress provided last fall dramatically expanded the tools available to address the needs of our system. Mr. Chairman, I would just add, uh, I know many members of the subcommittee have many questions. I've cleared my day. I'm happy to stay as long as you would like and answer all of your questions in as thorough a manner as possible. Thank you, sir. We all appreciate your presence here, Mr. Kashkari. Thank you for your testimony. We're now going to proceed with questions. Uh, members uh, will have uh, five minutes each for the purpose of asking questions. I'm going to begin, and then I'll go to our uh, ranking member, Mr. Jordan. And I would ask uh, all members to uh, please uh, try to observe the five minutes, because as Mr. Kashkari said, he'll stick around. and so. Uh, we are, are open to having several rounds of questions. Uh, I would like to begin, uh, Mr. Kashkari, with questions about the foreign uses of uh, TARP <coughs> funds. When Congress created the TARP, it was responding to a crisis in this country. U.S. businesses couldn't get a loan. American consumers couldn't get a loan. TARP was supposed to restore liquidity and the functioning of the credit market for them. So how do you justify to the American taxpayers a bank's decision made after receiving tens of billions of dollars in TARP monies to make a $7 billion investment in a Chinese construction company. Uh, Chairman, thank you, sir. Uh, I'll offer two, two comments to answer your question. First, we must remember that many of these financial institutions are global institutions, and they take deposits from savers all around the world, and they make loans all around the world. And while we may isolate and identify one transaction here or one transaction there, it's impossible because money's fungible. And I know you've all heard this comment before to track, did that money come from U.S. deposits? Did that money come from foreign deposits? We also have to be careful that if we set hard rules not letting our largest institutions do business abroad, other countries may say, okay, they're going to reciprocate and not let foreign banks then lend in America. So I understand your concern. I absolutely do, but we have to walk a fine line, let the businesses make commercial decisions, support the, support the system as a whole to get lending flowing. Now, uh, isn't it true that this loan was made uh, after Citigroup received TARP funds? Isn't that true? Uh, it, I don't know the details of it, but it appears to be the timing as such. Yes, sir. Excuse me. I, I want to go back to that. I, I want to restate the question. Uh, isn't it true that this decision to make this purchase uh, happened after uh, Bank of America made this purchase of stock? Uh, sir, I, I And, and after they know. received the TARP funds? Uh, um, Congressman, I don't know when, Chairman, I don't know when Bank of America made various investment decisions. I do know the dates of the announcements, and it appears the announcement was after uh, the TARP Investment. Right. Oh, I have here for the record the Bank of America had exercised remainder of China Construction Bank option, and it's uh, November 17th. They received the TARP funds in October. Mr. Kashgari, uh, when it's hard to get a loan in this country, is the Treasury's opinion that a bank that received TARP money is justified to arrange financing for an $8 billion loan to the government of Dubai? Uh, sir, again, May I, may I, I want to provide a thorough answer to you, Mr. Chairman. 
our highest priorities are twofold. Number one, stabilizing the financial system, and number two, making sure these banks can pay the taxpayers back. And so we've taken great care to not try to micromanage institutions, to encourage them to use the capital in commercially reasonable ways. We put specific protections in. We prohibited them from buying back stock. We prohibited them from increasing their dividends to create economic incentives for them to want to lend the money and earn a return on that but, money. But how does, if you, you know, people back home, as Mr. Cummings always likes to ask, people back home want to know, how does arranging an $8 billion loan to Dubai after someone gets TARP funds, how does that benefit the U.S. taxpayers whose money is being used? How does uh, helping a construction company in China get $7 billion after this Bank of America received TARP money. How does that help the U.S. taxpayers? Could you explain this? Sure. Th uh, thank you, sir. When our global firms do business abroad, and if they can make money and earn money abroad, that makes those institutions stronger. It puts those institutions in a better position to pay back the taxpayers because they're earning money. They're raising deposits around the world. So are these investments better? And is it better? Are you telling the American people that it's better to invest in another country than it is for these banks who have TARP money to invest in our own country? A absolutely not, Mr. Chairman. We absolutely want our banks investing in the U.S., lending in our communities. Did you know they were investing in China and in India and in, in Dubai and God knows where else? Do you know that? Well, I, I know that our large global financial institutions do business around the world. But do you, do you know specifically that companies got TARP funds? There's a credit freeze in this country. They get the TARP funds. And then instead of investing in American businesses, many of whom are starved for investment capital, they then export American taxpayers' dollars that were given under emergency circumstances. Did you know that? Well, again, Mr. Chairman, um, th this comes back to one of, the, one of the hardest problems we've had, honestly, I've had in my seat, is communicating this concept of tracking the dollars and where did taxpayer dollars go versus other dollars they got from deposits abroad, as an example. It's this fungibility question that we keep coming right. back to. And so, Mr. Chairman, it's been very hard for us to say, well, this dollar went for this purpose, the tax dollars went for another purpose. We want our banks to be healthy. We want them to lend in our communities. We want them to use the capital appropriately. We want them to show judgment in light of the economic crisis that we're facing. These are tough, these are tough I issues, think, Mr. I Chairman. I thank the gentleman. My time has expired. I'm going to go now to the ranking member, Mr. Jordan. Thank you. You may proceed, Mr. Jordan. And we'll, we'll come back. There will be another round I of questions. I appreciate that. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kaskar, we appreciate you being here. I want to attempt to, at least in my mind, um, cut to the chase. Uh, at the end of uh, your final sentence in paragraph 6, you say, finally, we are developing a public-private investment fund to purchase illiquid assets from banks to support new lending. I mean, that, in fact, uh, wouldn't you agree, but was the, was the whole um, motive for doing the, the bailout in the first place? As I, as I said to a, a group of farmers in my office this morning, I said the $64,000 question, or more appropriately the $700 billion question is, when are we going to be able to go after these assets, these mortgage-backed securities that caused the problem? That's how it was packaged to Congress. That's why members of both parties voted for it and supported the plan. And that was on October 3rd, 2008. To date, am I correct in, in saying that not one mortgage-backed security has been purchased? Uh, yes, sir. And so I, I want you to take as much time as you possibly can to talk about this developing program to do exactly what was supposed to happen five months ago. I think that, in my mind, is the key question, the key focus, and, and, and what has to take place if this is, if this is going to work. So take as much time or much time as I have left on my five minutes and, and walk me through that. Absolutely, sir. Uh, this is a program that Secretary Geithner is very focused on right now. We've got teams at Treasury working with the regulators. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. I apologize. Uh, this is a program Secretary Geithner is working on right now. Uh, we've got teams at Treasury working with the regulators to finalize the program. Uh, it will combine private sector capital with government capital uh, to go after and buy up these assets, sir? If I could just interject here. And we've had uh, Secretary Geithner in front of the Budget Committee, um, and he's talked about, he said basically the same sentences you just said right, right there. 
Can you, can you give us an idea how quickly that's going to happen? And as the chairman alluded to, I believe in, in his opening comments or someone on the panel did, is it a, is it a staffing concern that is, that is, is, is um, prolonging this decision or, or this, this program getting off the ground? Talk about that as well. Um, I expect, I believe Secretary Geithner has said he expects it to come out very quickly, you know, as early as within a few weeks. Um, again, people are doing a lot of work on that right now around the clock. It's not a staffing issue. These are complex issues that involve not just Treasury, not just the Federal Reserve, but the banking regulators. Uh, so there's, there's, these are complex issues that we need to make sure we get right. Sir. The public-private partnership you're talking about, what kind of um, encouraging statements, comments are you getting? What kind of feedback are you getting from the private sector side? Do they, are they buying into this, this approach that, that you're floating out there and talking about right now? Uh, we believe they are. In fact, we had received inbound unsolicited proposals from people in the private sector saying, we have capital on the sidelines. We want to go after these uh, assets. One of the key challenges right now is there's no financing available for the private sector investors. And so by marrying uh, government capital, taxpayer capital, with private sector capital and providing financing, you can enable those investors to then go after those, uh, those assets at a price that makes sense for the investors and at a price that makes sense for the banks. Because if the, if the private sector capital doesn't have any financing behind it, the returns they need will result in prices that are too low and the banks won't want to sell. So providing the financing is a key component. And it's not it's something the Treasury has to do with the regulators. It's complex, but the right people are focused on it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I yield to the, to the gentleman from California. Mr. Kashkari, I wanted to follow up on something that Chairman Kucinich had gotten into. Uh, yesterday, it was widely reported that Citibank had, I understand, two, two months in a row of making positive money. If they ceased uh, overseas loans, uh, my understanding is it's more than half of their total business. What would have happened to those profits? In other words, as much as we here on the day as want American dollars, American taxpayer dollars to go to American investment, if in fact we limited them from continuing their overseas operations, what would be the effects on the profitability of companies like uh, even Bank of America, but certainly Citibank? I, I expect the profits would fall dramatically, and they may in fact then need more taxpayer dollars to support them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I thank the uh, gentleman. We'll come back uh, on the uh, Republican side to Mr. Ice. Uh, I, and, and I'm going to ask unanimous consent uh, in connection with your line of questioning to introduce an article from the Washington Post on Friday, March 6th, uh, relating to this uh, public-private partnership, U.S. to invalt, uh, invite the wealthy to invest in a bailout by David Cho, consumer lending. It discusses this uh, very matter. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. You may proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kashkari, um, I just want to talk about just AIG for a moment. Um, you, you realize they have these what they call retention payments. Are you familiar with that? Uh, yes, sir. And one of the disturbing things about these retention payments was that they were supposed to, I mean, I kind of I understood it at first, that they wanted to retain key people uh, for certain units because it added value to those units and if they were to sell them, they would sell for less. I mean, if those people were to leave. But then the financial products division, they were given, they gave over $400 million worth of bonuses. And this is the very uh, unit that uh, everybody admits pretty much caused a lot of the problems for AIG. And then later on they, they talked about in an SEC filing, recent filing, they say they were giving retention payments for people that were going to be terminated. Now, are you familiar with that? Uh, no, actually, when you mentioned it earlier, that was the first I'd heard that's of that. Just, that's shocking to the conscience, isn't it? It sure is. I mean, see, that's the kind of thing. And, and when I talked earlier about the public being concerned this is, this is bigger than you. This is bigger than the Treasury. This is, and the reason why I say that is that when people begin to hear these kinds of stories and they hear about retention payments being paid for people who are leaving, for people who bought down the company, 
they don't, they, what it does is it, it's, and, and they are, at the same time, they see the moving van coming up to their house, taking their stuff away. And they're afraid, like the man said in my district the other day, to even look at their statement. Or they're getting a pink slip. They don't, they, they, I mean, some kind of way we got to get around that. And then you said something that I hadn't heard before when you talked about how in your statement you said we should not, you said the government must not attempt to force banks to make loans whose risks they are not comfortable with or attempt to direct lending from Washington. Bad lending practices uh, were the root cause. And I understand all of that. But there's got to be number one, transparency, and the American people have got to see that they are getting something out of the deal. That's the problem. Duh. I mean, they, they, and, and they are upset about that. They don't understand it. And we, and I know the president is doing a lot of great things, and I believe that we're going, I know we're going to get through this. We have to get through it. But the question then becomes is while the president and, 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 and all of you all are going in one direction trying to uplift the uh, American people and get this economy uh, right, um, is it that, I mean, it's, it's, it's already like going uphill, but I'm wondering if you don't see the problem that the transparency has, what it, the, the, the lack of transparency and accountability, what it does is it puts ice on that hill that you're trying to get up. And what does that mean? It means that it's, it's going to take a longer time, and it's going to mean that a lot of people are not going to have the trust. We need to get out of this mess as fast as we can. And I just don't think a slippery slope helps it. You got me? I do, Congressman. I, I, I couldn't agree more that uh, the communication challenge that we faced has been enormous. And if you look at what the President has done and what Secretary Geithner has done around some of the new programs, they've put in place requirements that the banks specify. Here's exactly how we're going to use the new funds. We're going to track that. We're going to measure and increase our lending relative to a baseline of what it would have been otherwise. And so there will be increased transparency. As the President said uh, before the joint address to Congress, he gets it. The challenge that we all face is uh, how do we get these programs to work, uh, make sure we provide the right transparency, strike the right balance. And, and this, this is my question. At what point do we say to the banks, we're giving you a billion. Bank, why don't you loan back, you know, a fourth of that or do something, you know, to help. In other words, you, you act like we got to sit by and say, oh, uh, bank, here's our money. Stay afloat. And while our people can't get the kinds of loans that they want. And I know you're doing some things with regard to loans, but I'm just saying these are the banks that are getting the big bucks. Uh, well, Chairman, I'm glad you raised this. This is a really fundamental point that I think we don't talk about enough, which is the banks are a big part of the story. Banks typically provide 60 percent of credit in our economy. The non-banks, the securitization market provides the other 40 percent. The banks are lending, not as much as we would all like, but they are lending. The securitization market is gone right now. It's completely frozen. And so we've now launched this new consumer business lending initiative with the Federal Reserve specifically to get loans to people buying cars, small businesses, credit cards, small, et cetera, to get the lending going again. So part of it is the banks, part of it's transparency for the banks, but a big part of it is the non-bank market. And we've now launched a whole separate program to get at that problem. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, the Chair recognizes Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kashkari, uh, we, there's so many questions, and I appreciate your willingness to stay for a very long day. Uh, first of all, uh, you don't know a lot about me, and you know people come in my office to see a bunch of patents, and and they think that means technology. Uh, long before I was fortunate enough to be uh, uh, in electronics, I, the Army paid for me to go to. Uh, DEC school, as it was called back uh, then in, in Massachusetts. And, and I got to see early on how computers were not interoperable, but how they could be, and how when you needed to do big projects, you made them interoperable. When we look at XBRL, you're very familiar with that uh, technology. In a nutshell, if everyone were reporting 
in a XBRL compliant fashion so that various companies and that are developing software to read and to analyze were able to see with that common set of, if you were reporting, would your transparency that you don't have enough of today be virtually absolute? This is assuming that mortgages were put in that format, that credit cards were in that uh, format, obviously that uh, 10Ks and 10Qs were all in that format, something that's coming. <coughs> Uh, and, of course, the FDIC, all the material that is already in that format, in addition to the 40 countries or more that are already reporting. If you had all of that today here in Washington, would you have the transparency you need to do your job and do it well? Uh, Congressman, I think it would definitely help to provide common data formats and a seamless way to flow all that data up to one interface that the American people could look at easily. The only caution I'll offer is, as a businessman, you know, you are hesitant, business people are hesitant to provide some of their details to their competitors. And so it may still not answer, well, how many individual loans or to who did this individual loan get, but it would certainly help the transparency. Well, uh, assuming for a moment that where information goes is separate from whether or not it's in that format, uh, if everyone that you had uh, or were willing to loan money to or were part of the stabilization were already had the data in that format and could deliver it on your request, would you then have the transparency you want? Uh, again, I believe, I believe it would help. I, I don't know enough about it to know if it would be perfect, but I believe it would help. Okay. Can I have your commitment today? You know the second panel. Uh, which may not get, we may not get to if we keep you all day, uh, includes uh, the president of that organization. We, uh, we, if the gentleman yield, we, we will get to that. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm willing to stay in tonight, too. But the, uh, the second panel includes the president of that nonprofit organization. And, you know, I'm not touting any one format for data, but I am concerned that unless we both go forward with a common interface that you can at least uh, avail yourself of and uh, obviously, uh, find out, and I think we are going to hear that uh, retrospectively they can, in fact, analyze many of the things you are not analyzing. If we don't do both of those, you are going to be back here in two or three months uh, not having yet skied, and, uh, and we are going to be asking you some of these same questions about transparency. Yeah, I would be very happy to look into it, sir. Thank you. Uh, for the record, uh, because I, I, I know it is not a fair question to hit you with today, I would appreciate this committee getting an understanding of where Treasury believes that, if the figure is correct that I have read, that we are at about 300 percent of GDP in debt, historically, long term historically, 100 to 120, where you believe we are going to settle out in sort of the post euphoria period so that this committee could begin understanding how much contraction you are not trying to fight and how much contraction you are trying to fight in the loan market. Uh, absolutely. I will work with our economists to look at that. You are completely correct. Deleveraging is taking place. It is necessary. We don't want it to overcorrect and we don't want the adjustment to be too rapid or uh, disorderly. Okay. The, uh, I have one tough question and, and I want to be fair. Uh, I hope we are not blindsiding you, but you are familiar with the Wall Street Journal report of uh, uh, 22nd of January of 2009 uh, that talked about political influence? I am. You are. Uh, I'd like to give you a full opportunity to talk in terms of the pressures that you or others have been under, what effect they are having, whether they provide <coughs> guidance or whether that pressure is undue coming from Congress. Uh, the journal uh, talked both about uh, Ohio uh, uh, potential influence and it talked about New York in, or Massachusetts influence. But I I'd like you to talk more broadly, uh, not necessarily just that article. Tell me what it's like when uh, for you with various groups, including perhaps some of us on the dais, being concerned about our individual banks off of the dais. Um, thank you. Actually, thank you very much for asking me that because that's a very important topic and I appreciate the chance to set the record straight. Um, we have built a very robust process at Treasury for the banks that are applying for TARP funds. They send an application to the regulator. The regulator submits a recommendation to Treasury. We have a formal process of reviewing that, getting more data if we need it, and then making decisions. I have certified part of the, the Obama administration's uh, transparency initiative has begun having the head of the office, so I have, certified to Congress now in January and at the end of February that all of our investment decisions from the beginning 
October 3rd through the current period have been made purely on the merits of the case, the economic merits, and not due to any undue influence. And I feel completely confident that we have a great track record of that. Now, we do get calls from members. We do get calls from governors who are concerned about their districts or their businesses, et cetera. It's important for us to get that feedback of what's happening around the country. Um, most of the time, we just refer uh, people who call to the regulators because the bank regulators regulate these institutions. So I feel very confident in saying there's no undue influence at Treasury. All right, I'm the, I'm the person who signs each of these. Uh, and I'm, I'm positive of that. How, having said that, I'm concerned that these stories have been out there because they serve to undermine confidence. So if, if you'd like to ask further questions about that, I'd love to go into it Perhaps in Perhaps on the second round. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman's time Thank has you. expired. I uh, appreciate his questioning. Uh, the Chair recognizes Mr. Tierney of Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having this hearing as well on that. Uh, Mr. Kashkari, thank you for being with us here today. Uh, may I ask you a question uh, that I think uh, our constituents often raise? We have extensive taxpayer money invested into these banks now, and their feeling is that we're investing in banks that are operated by individuals who were complicit in getting us into this financial situation. Why are we not using the leverage of our investment to change some of the boards of directors in some of the principal offices of these corporations uh, to get them out and get other people in. Uh, thank you. Sir, we, we must segment our broadly available programs. I mentioned we have 489 banks we've invested in. The vast majority of those are healthy banks lending in their communities. There's no reason for us to go in there and try to make any management changes there. We also have these one-off institutions where we've had to intervene to st stabilize them. In the case of AIG, as an example, we fired the management, brought in new management, and we're trying to help them have enough time to pay back the taxpayers. In the case of Citigroup, our recent agreement with Citigroup, they've agreed to change their board of directors so that a majority of the board uh, is made up of independent outside directors. So we hear you, we agree with that perspective, and when we have to take extraordinary action, we're coming in to make sure that these businesses are well managed and that we do not reward failure. Is there an action that the uh, Treasury can take uh, to amend the uh, agreements uh, to define waste, fraud, and abuse, and then to put a provision in there that when uh, we see it, uh, and I assume at some point you're going to send people out to these banks as well as the surveys and things, when we see it, we can take action, whether it's to reverse uh, that expenditure uh, or not. I mean, people look and they hear stories of money being invested in conferences and sporting events and endorsements uh, and things of that nature and perks and bonuses that, uh, to people that ought not to be getting them. Uh, when are we going to have the uh, position as investors here uh, to be able to just uh, take those out, set them aside, and recapture that money if it's, uh, if it's happening? Uh, Congressman, in the new program that the administration has announced, uh, well, we are going to make sure that boards of directors adopt very clear and published expense policies on things like airplane flights and conferences and perks, et cetera, and then certify that they are meeting their standards. The standards will be public for the world to see and for the world to judge. Uh, and if we can offer our opinion on what those standards look like as well when we see them, number one. Number two, remember, in terms of fraud, there are very strong laws in place for fraud already. And we will go, if anybody tries to defraud, defraud the Treasury or the taxpayer, we are going to bring the full arsenal of tools we have available to us to go after them. And then third, Congress has provided four bodies of oversight for the TARP. Special Inspector General, GAO, Congressional Oversight Panel, Financial Stability Oversight Board. Later this afternoon, you're going to hear from the Special Inspector General, whose very mission is to go after waste, fraud, and abuse. So we're looking at it, and there are independent oversight bodies looking at it as well. I, and I think people do think that some of those conferences, jets, perks, and bonuses get to be waste, fraud, and abuse. And as the definition of them is something, whether you would term them in those words or not, uh, that that money can be prohibited from being spent in that way during this interim period or at least reclaimed if it was. It would be very important for people. I think Patrick made some good comments on that about the way people are feeling. Uh, let me ask you this as well. On the asset purchase program that you're planning to do, that Secretary Geithner is planning to do, what will be the taxpayer uh, assurance uh, or protection for their money on this? Will they form a partnership with these hedge funds or other investment groups? Uh, how will they get their money back? What will be their collateral in the interim? because the general impression of that now is going to be, here are these people, the hedge fund people and people like that, that benefited most from a broken system that people think they're complicit in breaking, and now they're going to be partners using taxpayer money to come in and get a tremendous profit potentially on the other end. Uh, how do we tell people that that's a good concept, if, if you think it is, 
uh, and it would tell people why that's being done as opposed to some alternative method and what's their protection that they'll get their tax money back? Uh, Congressman, the, as I indicated earlier, the details are being finalized now, but one way of doing that, so I don't want to commit to this, but one way of doing that is if the taxpayer dollars are side by side, meaning exact economic terms, so with the private sector dollars. So if the private sector wins, the taxpayers win. If the, ta if the taxpayer loses, the private sector loses. By perfectly aligning our interests, we think that may be the best way to protect taxpayers. At the end of the day, there's, a, and there's an aversion to taking risk right now because the markets are nervous. And so we as the U.S. government, as the taxpayers, have to now step in and be willing to take some risk. They're no less nervous. Uh, I understand. They're more nervous, particularly playing what they think is a cast of characters, if I can use that loosely. It may or may not even be applicable or fair, but they perceive these people as being part of the problem who are now going to benefit. And would you just comment to that in the remaining time? What should you tell people that these are the people we're dealing with now? They profited during the time that this was all being driven into crisis, and they may have been responsible for some of that. And now they're going to be our partners going forward, and they may benefit greatly from that. Uh, uh, the gentleman's time has expired, but Mr. Kashgari, uh, please answer the question. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Uh, thank you, Chairman. We, we do not yet know which investors will come to the partnership, but my expectation is you will see pension plans coming. You will see people's retirement funds through uh, you know, mutual fund type organizations that will be investing. So there may be some well known investors that people recognize. My, assumption is that most of the capital is going to come from the savings of the American people. Okay. Uh, I, th I thank the uh, uh, gentleman, and we're going to get more into that in the next round. Um, Mr. Souter of Indiana, you may proceed with your question. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Koshkari. My, my district needs credit. It's the number one manufacturing district in the United States. Elkhart County has the RVs. We're at 18.3 percent unemployment there. LaGrange is at 18, typically uh, 13 to 17 percent throughout my, all my eight counties. Um, I have a couple of uh, fundamental uh, questions. It was a tremendous insight, not very understood in uh, Congress, that only 60 percent of the credit comes from banks. And you said the securitization group is 40 percent that has zero right now, uh, that in the banks, do you know how much of that's going to refinancing in the loans as opposed to uh, actual new purchases? Um, <clears throat> Congressman, I don't have that at my fingertips. I believe it's, some of that is included in our survey. I can go back and find those numbers and get them to you. As, as a fundamental question, because Congress and the general public wants more transparency, do you feel your problem is transparency right now? Uh, oh, forgive me, sir. In Which other problem? Words, what, we're talking about us being able to see and, and transparency as we do oversight, building trust, American people. Do you feel that you don't know what's going on? In other words, do you need more transparency? I don't believe so. I think the challenges that we're facing, you know, this credit crisis has been unpredictable and it's gotten deeper along the way. And so the challenges we have are striking the right balance of taking aggressive action that we know is going to work but also protecting the taxpayers. You know, it would be easy if we were willing to just throw money out the window and, and not care about protecting the taxpayers. We could probably clean this up, but it would cost the taxpayers a lot of money. And so and, striking that balance is hard. And following up with that, as you have heard several times, we were told from the beginning that we were going to get the toxic mortgages. Yet every person who, who comes in, every angle that comes in, different presidents say they are going to do toxic mortgages and they didn't. When you got into this, how much of this was actually toxic mortgages as opposed to toxic credit cards, toxic student loans, toxic car loans? Yep. And in the troubled asset, if you purchase this, is that really going to fix the problem? So that's a good question. There's no question the start of this was about mortgages, but the crisis in the mortgage market, residential plus commercial mortgages, is a $14 trillion market. So the crisis in the mortgage market put a huge burden on the financial system, which made the financial system pull back from all of these other markets. So when we're doing things on student loans or credit cards or auto loans, that's not to try to solve the root cause of the problem. That's frankly dealing with a symptom to help the American people get through this while we stabilize the root cause, the mortgage market, the financial system. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Yes, because it would be much harder to take a L.L. Bean sweater back as an asset that's been securitized through a credit card than a mortgage. And that's why it's important to know what's in, in what, uh, that many of us believe that, well, <clears throat> I want to ask a question about mark-to-market, because that's partly under 
your assumption of that you needed to get into the banking to provide capital when part of, at least in the banking sector, it's not clear in the securitization sector, um, that having a declining economy is turning things toxic that weren't toxic. Uh, that, uh, and the banks don't know where their bottom is. In, in my area where the unemployment is accelerating, where among the people who are employed are still the biggest GM pickup plant in the world. Uh, the 50 percent of the GM suppliers are in my district. So if you're a lender right now, you don't know where the bottom is. You don't know whose house is, is where. And the mark to market has exacerbated that problem. Now, it also started some of our problem by not having real market values. Uh, and I understand that. But isn't there some way that in today's accounting era, in computers, that there could be some kind of a blended, because a lot of these assets aren't going to be sold. In Indiana, many people don't move all that much, yet the housing has just gone to nothing. So the bank assets are declining. What's going to happen in agriculture land if we don't support the ethanol uh, as that market changes? And that they can't, the, the assets don't have any value. So they don't know how to make a loan for a pickup or an RV, or the various things that we make. And until we get that credit market, they don't even know how to do a credit evaluation on an individual. So why aren't we looking at some of this mark to market to stabilize their asset valuation? Because how can they make a loan when they don't know what their assets are? Congressman, this is a very important point. A lot of people have asked us about it. The challenge is, and there's no question, mark to market is what we call pro-cyclical. So it exaggerates the swings in both directions. The challenge is right now investors don't have confidence in the statements that they're seeing, even with the mark to market. And so they're, they're cautious. For us to go in the middle of a crisis and to change the accounting rules, it's not going to increase me, confidence. Let me interrupt you for just a, sure. a second here because I've run out of time. Mr. Chairman, since I didn't do an opening statement, can I have a, just a follow up to this? You, uh, the gentleman's time has expired, but if you. Uh, have a quick question. You can that, respond. That in the in this uh, challenge, that the it's been clearly documented, even from the transparency there is, that there's really a small number of counties that got inflated and in where these toxic mortgages are. That when you've only had two percent inflation in your assets, the argument that they don't know what the value is is just not there. That's why can't you, the 80-20 rule, uh, 20 does 80 percent of your sales, that's clearly true here in these mortgages. Why Mr. can't that be applied in some way to these assets? It's not like there isn't a historical tracking, this isn't computerized. I, I don't understand uh, why there's lack of confidence in everything all over the United States when, in fact, it tends to be localized inflated markets. If you could respond briefly. Thank you. Uh, there's no question the housing market is very regional. And there are regions where the maximum run up and now the maximum uh, run down. But the crisis is so large and severe, it's affected the confidence of the American people and investors. And so they're all nervous right now. And so, again, it's hard for us and the government to say, you shouldn't be nervous. Go ahead and make that loan. What we need to do is attack the root cause of the problem, get credit flowing until confidence can return, and then the system can start functioning as it should. I thank the uh, gentleman. Uh, Chair recognizes uh, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Watson. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Kaskari, you might have answered this, but I am still confused. And uh, to quote your words again, uh, you are saying to us that we should not be involved in micromanaging um, recipient institutions. You know, where did the money go? And you said, however well intended, government officials are not positioned to make better commercial decisions than lenders in their community. Bad lending practices were at the root of the cause of this crisis. What would be your definitions of waste, fraud, and abuse? You know, how do you determine that there were bad practices? How do we get into this mess? Uh, and what are you going to do about it? Would you try to clarify for me what you define as abuse and fraud? Uh, absolutely. Well, f what got us into this mess were banks making loans that to borrowers who could not afford to pay. Also, homeowners have responsibility as well for taking on loans that they couldn't afford to pay. 
regulators had a role to play because they're the supervisors of these institutions allowing the banks to make bad loans. And so those are the bad lending practices that I was talking about. And so in, in a time when people are nervous, ordering a bank to make a loan that, the, that they think is too risky is a dangerous, uh, dangerous place to go. Now, in terms of waste, fraud, and abuse, I think fraud is clear, especially when it relates to either banks lying to borrowers or borrowers lying to banks or banks lying to Treasury and the U.S. government. Again, we're going to come down on them very, very hard. In terms of waste, the administration has put out uh, some specifications around when we have our new capital program up and running, the banks are going to have to define a very clear expense policy on what they think is appropriate and what's not appropriate, and they're going to have to certify that they're meeting that policy, and that policy will be available for the American people to see. All right, Ken, if I write your letter in regards to uh, what I just inquired about, would you respond, and can I put that up on my website for my constituents to refer to. Absolutely. We're trying to get to the bottom of this <coughs> and risky business. And I'm going to now uh, give some of my time to my colleague because there was a question that uh, you wanted. Thank you for yielding on that. Uh, just to, to follow up on that, you talked about this is what you're going to do on the next program. What about the money that's already out there? That's a substantial amount of money and how are we going to track that money and stop that practice from either continuing or being started with the funds that are already out there? Well, uh, Congressman, again, we have to – I segment those firms receiving exceptional assistance from the broadly available programs. We, we have – and we can debate this – we have a view that when we're lending to a small community bank, that wasn't part of the problem. Well, let's take them out. Okay, let's take well, them let's out. Let's talk about the ones that are in the news every day that are great at you and me and, and our constituents on that. The large firms have got a big chunk of dough that continue to have a conference in a very fancy place, that continue to uh, fly like they're zillionaires, that continue uh, to uh, sponsor sporting events in these big boxes, the corporate boxes, whatever. What about them? No, absolutely. And we, we've, we've been pretty vocal that we want the institutions to take prudent action and to re reflect on the kind of economic environment we're in and the and the help that they've already received. But other than reflection, is there any enforcement mechanism? Uh, we, that's precatory language. I wish you would do better, uh, and that would be great. We all wish that. Can we enforce them into doing better, or has that train left the station? Well, I think we can. We've, we have, in many cases, for the exceptional cases, we've asked banks to put together expense policies that, we'll, that we are able to review, and that if they want to make any changes to their expense policies, they have to get Treasury's approval. That's all going forward? That's policy? No, that, no, some of that is going back but as well. But are you telling me that we can't do anything about the money that's out the door, that it can't be recaptured, or that people cannot be? Uh, if those are the people that made those decisions and they've got our money, maybe we should have some impact from having that money invested and get rid of them. Right? These aren't the small community bankers. They're sure. not the problem. We're all comfortable with that. But are these fat cats that are running around and still wasting money in that sense and not listening to the precatory language about what we wish they would do, why not use some leverage of us being the investors to just off with those people and in with people that understand the gravity of the situation? Well, I will say that when we have seen things that we thought were over the top and, you know, just really graded on us the way it's grading on you and grading on your constituents, we have let the banks know. And whether we have a legal ability to force them to do something, they generally get the message and say, we got it, sorry, it's not going to happen again. Now, the, the, the fine line we all have to walk, I mentioned two objectives. There are many objectives, but our two biggest objectives are stabilizing the system and having the taxpayers paid back. And so banks do need to market themselves. They unfortunately do need to have sales conferences so people want to come in, learn their products, sell their products. Some of the press stories that have really inflamed people, when we've looked into them, They've been more ordinary core sales conferences that actually didn't cost the banks much money. I'm not defending it. I'm just saying we have to walk a fine line and allow the banks to run their business and compete so that they can pay the taxpayers back. I disagree with that, sir. I think we're talking about the ones that don't walk, the ones that go over the line Fair enough. and getting back the money that they wasted on that and leaning on them uh, legally or not to say show good faith and to get any future system us, you better find a way to get that money back into the till that the impact taxpayers have invested in. Time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. I, I thank uh, the gentlelady and the gentleman. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Burton of Indiana. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When you first started dispensing the TARP funds, uh, did you have oversight 
uh, procedures, uh, definitions, and allowable and prohibited uses of TARP funds and uniform disclosure and reporting standards when you first started dispensing those? <clears throat> or did you just start saying, oh my gosh, we got to get money to this bank or this institution because it's about to go under? I mean, I just wonder how prepared you were to start loaning that money or putting that money out there. Um, Congressman, we, as you remember, when we started out with asset purchases and then as in the data that I reflected in my testimony, conditions deteriorated very rapidly, much more quickly than we had expected. So we moved as fast as possible to put capital into the system. One, one minor comment there is, remember, we're buying shares in these companies, preferred stock, getting warrants. So it's not literally giving cash. We are getting securities back. And the banks are paying dividends. We've received over $2 billion in dividends in the first quarter. If you bought Citigroup, you, you, so far you've lost a ton. But uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is, did you have the time or the inclination to put these procedures in place before you started putting that money out there? We did not put specific tracking procedures in place in okay, terms so of... Okay, you, so you, you, were, you were trying to find out as quickly as possible and flying by the seat of your pants, so to speak. Moving as quickly as possible. Yeah. Well, that's an old Hoosierism, <laughs> flying by the seat of your pants. You know, you were hesitant when Mr. Souter asked you the question about uh, uh, did, did you know really what's going on? And uh, my question is, do you have the manpower over there? I've, I've been told that uh, Mr. Geithner, Secretary of Treasury Geithner, uh, doesn't have an awful lot of the staff people in place or assistants in place so that he can really start uh, completing his tasks as quickly as possible because he doesn't have adequate staff. Do you have adequate staff and does Mr. Geithner have adequate staff? Uh, and if not, how long is it going to take? Uh, Congressman, uh, I do. The Office of Financial Stability had zero people on October 2nd. We have more than 100 full-time employees and we're growing every day. The staff is fully operational. It was one of our highest priorities to make sure that the program could run well and we'd have a smooth transition. In terms of Secretary Geithner, he has a very strong team of political appointees around him and the Senate confirmed appointees, the White House is moving as fast as possible and are making real progress from what I understand. Well, it was reported in, I think, the Wall Street Journal that uh, several of those slots that were very important had not been filled. And with the, with the seriousness of the situation, I was wondering if you were up to speed, and you say you are. Uh, I am, especially I can speak in great de detail to my office, the Office of Financial Stability. We have a wonderful career staff of people who are passionate about these issues and are working around the clock. Okay, I have one last question. Uh, we've dispensed uh, total, I don't know how much of that you've, you've already put into the system, but uh, $700 billion in TARP funds. How much more are you going to need? Uh, Congressman, this I don't... This is very important. I know it because is. Because every time we talk to anybody about what's going on, uh, we get kind of a, an amb ambiguous answer. When, when, when Secretary Geithner was testifying on how much in funds he was going to need to prop up the financial institutions. He said, well, one or two trillion, maybe three. I mean, <laughs> you know, we're not talking about dollars here. We're talking about trillions. And so uh, what's the formula for letting us know how much more you're going to need, and can you give us that? We have enough. There, my staff just said that, that we've deployed about $325 billion cash dollars out the door. More than that has been obligated at this point. Is that the second tranche or the first? No, that's within the first tranche still. First tranche. Actual cash dollars that have left Treasury. Again, more than that has been allocated to various programs. We have enough to get Secretary Geithner's new programs up and running and working. And as we get them up and running, we get them working. When the bank's capital, you know, they're under this capital assessment right now where the regulators are analyzing the bank's capital positions under various economic scenarios. That will give us a lot more information about how much more is needed. And as we see our programs get up and running, we're going to learn a lot. So, Congressman, I cannot give you a number today, okay. nor can I give you a date. But we will come well, let as you know. As you could get that, we'd like to have it, number one. But one more question. Do you think if we had across-the-board tax cuts plus capital gains tax cuts, it would in assist in stimulating the economy and helping you out? Uh, <laughs> Congressman, I must respectfully defer to my, my colleagues who focus on tax and budget issues. I am solely focus on financial stability, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Chair, thanks, Mr. Burton. And I just, uh, Mr. Burton, I just want to uh, let you know that er uh, at, at the beginning of the hearing, uh, we introduced into the record an article from the Washington Post uh, dated Tuesday, March 10, 2009, by David Schmick that uh, predicts 
that the uh, bailouts will run another uh, as much as another two trillion dollars. Here's a marked up copy of it, well, and we, can, we can go back to that in the next round. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you for being here, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate your holding these hearings. Um, just to follow up with my colleague from Indiana um, about the staffing issues, if I could, <clears throat> could you uh, answer for me um, what the staff is at the Inspector General's office uh, for rooting out uh, fraud and waste at the uh, IG's office or the Treasury's office for this TARP program? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And you, uh, you'll hear from Mr. Borofsky. I believe his staff is in the order of 20 people or so right now. Uh, I'm sorry, sir, could you hear me? Mr. Borofsky, uh, the Special Inspector General, you'll hear from him later today who can give you an updated number. My understanding is he has about 20 people in his office right now and is growing uh, quickly as well. If the gentleman will yield briefly, uh, Mr. Borofsky is on a third panel. Okay, so 20 people for, for what, 8,000 banks in this country or how many banks have we have? We've invested in 489 institutions through the capital program. And how many more banks are? T uh, Several hundred, maybe 500 to 1,000 more are in the pipeline. But we're talking about uh, banks also, uh, top um, several banks with assets, 75 percent of our nation's assets are in the top several banks. And we have 20 people, 20 people doing the audits of those things? Well, again, sir, I'll respectfully defer to Mr. Borofsky. He, I know that he is growing his staff quickly and is leveraging the resources okay. of the other law enforcement See, agencies. I think that's where I think where concerns come in, because before we're going to be able to pass another nickel in this uh, Congress, we're going to have to get the due diligence on these things because uh, our constituents are going to demand it. Um, the foreign entities that have received dollars. I mean, I asked my first question. My Bank of America in Rhode Island received $45 billion from the Capital Purchasing Program, first in Salmon and Tarp, and Ken Lewis from CEO of Bank of America said, taxpayers want to see how this money is used to restart the economy. And then they went around and laid off 121 employees at a facility in my district in Rhode Island. And then after they received $7 billion in Tarp funds, they went ahead and loaned it overseas to China. So. Uh, we have questions, and we want to know where are these dollars going. Are they going to foreign entities? Are, are they, what dividends are they paying? And to whom? I mean, are they going to paying little old grandma's annuities? <laughs> are, they, are they going to paying whose bondholders? And what are the salaries that are being paid? I mean, you know, there are a lot of the culture on Wall Street, people have gotten so accustomed to saying they're worth $2 million a year. And I don't know, but they're just, you know, when people are earning on average um, 40 grand a year in my uh, district, and that's, you know, median wage, that's, they just don't get people, you know, in, you know, Wall Street asking for hundreds of thousands of dollars, let alone millions. And, and yet that's the culture in Wall Street, to, to just ask for these uh, sums of money. So I can tell you, we've got to have a, a new kind of um, salary type compensation system. I know some firms have put new executive commission system. I know some firms have put Um, and we need to insist on in terms of our conditions in, in loaning these dollars for no other reason than they're not going to receive any more dollars. Because once our constituents learn that any one of these uh, folks are earning uh, these kinds of uh, salaries in the wake of, of our constituents earning just what they're earning, they're just not going to be satisfied with uh, the way this is going. So uh, I might ask you to comment on, on that. That issue. Uh, thank you, Congressman. This is um, an area we've done a lot of work on, beginning with Im imposing the executive compensation requirements that were specified in the ESA. We imposed those day one from the program. Uh, the Obama administration has now, in early February, the Treasury Department came out with new, uh, tighter executive compensation policies. And then in the stimulus bill, there is an amendment that also has executive compensation policies. So we've taken this issue very seriously. There's a team right now at Treasury working on the stimulus, the new law, 
putting that together with the administration's new policy to come out with a robust set of new regulations that are going to govern the banks that are taking the TARP funds and covering many of their top executives on how much they can earn and what form that compensation is. So we heard it. We got the message. We're working hard on it. I understand it's a lot of mid-level management, too. We're not just talking the top, top. The uh, gentleman's time has thank expired. You. I thank the gentleman. The uh, chair recognizes Mr. Turner of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kekari. appreciate you being here. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you up front, I voted against this program. <clears throat> I, I voted against this program because basically four reasons. One, I didn't believe there was a very good definition or focus on what the program was to do. You know, we were first told it was toxic assets. Now it has not been. Uh, two, I think there was a lack of understanding of the process, what happens after the monies are made available, that process. <clears throat> Third, I didn't think it addressed the practices that got us here to begin with. It didn't stop the practices that, that were occurring. And four, it was unclear as to where the money was needed and how much was needed. Now, you have been very forthcoming. I want to congratulate you on you're doing a very good job in, in answering our questions. But no one can still answer those four questions. I mean, we're now several billion dollars, hundred billion dollars into this, and, and we're still where we don't have a clear focus of what we're going to be doing with these funds. We're not certain as to what the process is going to be. We have not addressed at all any of the practices that got us in this place. And still, you are unable to tell us how much money this is going to take. Now, I wanted to comment on one thing that you had said. Uh, you had said, when someone asked you how did we get in this, this situation, you said <clears throat> that banks loaned borrowers money that they couldn't pay, homeowners have responsibility and regulators have responsibility. Well, I want to tell you that I come from Ohio. Montgomery County, Ohio is, is the place where I live. It's in the center of my district. Um, and we have the foreclosure crisis, and we've had it for over a decade. Um, the, um, it's been about 27,000 foreclosures have occurred in my county since the six and a half years that I have, have been here in Congress of a county that has a population of around 500,000. Unbelievable numbers of foreclosure. I believe that it's not just that banks loaned money to people who couldn't pay. I believe from the experience that we've seen in our county of people who have tried to address this issue that it's actual structural issue. It's a leverage ratio that that predatory lenders and subprime lenders were actually targeting homeowners and loaning them money that was in excess of the value of the home, which of course results structurally in a situation where when there's financial stress that you have to go to foreclosure. If you have no equity, you have no option other than to go to foreclosure. And the big banks initially would say, well, we're not really part of that. But, but they were, because what was happening is, I believe, the structural aspect of loaning greater than the value of the, of the property People didn't care because they were selling these things as securities on down the stream. So they didn't care if it was a workable loan or if the asset was overvalued because in the end they weren't going to get stuck in the musical chairs of, of these, these assets. Um, I think in the end when we get these evaluated we're going to find that this is somewhat the largest theft in history that has occurred of people who overvalued assets, sold them down the stream and then the American taxpayers are stepping in unfortunately um, with, uh, with, with their own dollars to try to make up the gap. Now here's my concern on specifically about an, an issue that uh, was alluded to in the beginning of this discussion. Some of the monies that are being provided are, are going to appear to assist in transactions where the money is leaving the country. Now I think you know, everybody up here understands that there are you know, international practices of, of the, the um, flows of capital and that needs to happen for our economy to be, be successful also. Um, but the Fed Chairman yesterday, Bernanke, stated this, to asking about the crisis itself. He says, in my view, however, it is impossible to understand this crisis without reference to the global imbalance in trade and capital flows that began in the latter half of the 1990s. Well, back to my concern about the practices haven't changed. One of my concerns is that the manner in which this is occurring does not have any protections or requirements that the dollars address the issues of, of our economy and that portions of, large portions of these dollars are, are leaving our economy. That would put us on the wrong side of the ledger and in the same types of practices that Branke just said are, are underlining this. We, we know that you can't, in, in providing dollars, stop international flows of capital. We don't want that. But I am concerned that what you're doing might facilitate or incent additional dollars leaving uh, our economy that are specifically intended to prop up our economy. Could you please comment? Sure, Congressman. Thank you. Um, 
I didn't catch all of Chairman Bernanke's remarks, but I believe he's referring to uh, there's many economists think that there's been a glut of savings around the world in developing countries, and it's been coming into our capital markets. So the, ca the cash has actually been flowing the opposite. It's been flowing to America, which has given us very low borrowing rates and encouraged us, some would say, to take on more debt, maybe more debt than we can afford. And so I think we have to be careful, especially right now. We want all the capital we can get to get through this crisis, and we need to let the global economy restabilize to a new equilibrium where savings and all of these things are balanced. So I take your point. I hear it. And I, I agree with the spirit of it. I'm just offering a word of caution about saying let's stop money flowing in this one direction because it will end up stopping it coming back the way that we want it. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired, but I do, I, I do want to say uh, we're going to uh, have two more members to ask questions, and then we'll uh, take a brief recess. I also want to tell the, uh, the, the gentleman from Ohio uh, that uh, since you raised the question about Montgomery County and, and of course, Dayton, and since my own community in Cleveland uh, was the subject of a New York Times uh, magazine article uh, this past week, uh, we are going to go back to Ohio, and we'll come to uh, to your community as well, uh, and maybe we can get the hearings on the same day in Cleveland and in Dayton. So I just want you to know that this this committee is going to be going deeply into these affected areas. I, I thank the gentleman for raising the question, and the chair recognizes Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Kashkari. Uh, just a few things uh, to establish where we agree. Uh, you would agree, obviously, that the taxpayer is entitled to know uh, how taxpayer money is spent? Yes. Uh, and I assume you would agree that shareholders would, would be entitled to know how shareholder money is spent? Yes. Uh, and, of course, the biggest recipient of taxpayer money to date, uh, or one of the biggest, is AIG. Uh, and that is where the taxpayer is fronting money and the taxpayer, in fact, is an 80 percent owner, correct? Yes. Uh, and we're providing that money in order to avert uh, the, a conclusion that's been reached at Treasury and the Fed uh, that to let AIG go down would cause systemic failure, correct? Yes. Now, do you, Donald Cohn, who is the Vice Chair, as you know, of the Federal Reserve, uh, says that AIG has no obligation to name the counterparties uh, who have been paid uh, via taxpayer money that has been transferred to AIG. Correct. I read uh, G Governor Cohn's or Vice Chair Cohn's testimony, but I don't remember that exact quote. But I defer to you, sir. Okay. Do you agree with him? I believe uh, institutions such as AIG that receive extraordinary assistance have a moral obligation to disclose as much as possible to the American people. Uh, if I may permit, if you will permit me to give you a thorough answer, the challenge here is, as I indicated earlier. We want to prevent a financial collapse to stabilize the system, and we want to pay back the taxpayers. And so we have to be careful that just as any business, if you put, if you force businesses to expose all of their business decisions, all of who their customers are, all of who their counterparties are, that may actually put them at a competitive disadvantage. Right, so and then it makes it harder to pay back the taxpayers. Yeah, I get it. So then you agree with Governor Cohen. We'll leave it to AIG to decide what information they will disclose and they won't disclose with them making the final decision on whether that is a business interest or not, correct? No, I, I believe we can, we can work with the Fed to work with AIG and figure out, take a, take a look from Treasury's perspective right, let me, let me and ask say what is appropriate to disclose. Some of that AIG money uh, that's to avert ta uh, the systemic failure is to make certain that average Americans who have AIG insurance policy, AIG annuities, uh, and, and AIG financial products uh, and pensions uh, don't get hammered, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, but some of the counterparties are uh, uh, eyes wide open investors. Uh, some of the largest investment banks that we used to have in this country, hedge funds, and speculators who made bets that turned out sour. Uh, do you believe that it would be of interest to the American taxpayer to know whether their money is being used to protect those annuity holders, those insurance policy holders, those pensioners on the one hand uh, versus the hedge fund speculators, uh, investment banks on the other? Just yes or no? Well, C Congressman, I would like to provide you a thorough answer because it is important. No, the question is a simple one. Would, in your opinion, do you think it would be of interest to taxpayers to know whether it is the hedge funds, investment banks, speculators 
being assisted with their money or annuity holders, pensioners, uh, and insurance uh, contract holders? And the, the answer is they're all being benefited because there's, unfortunately, there's no way we can go in to stabilize an institution and say just the policyholders are stabilized. If Why we not? Because if we did that, the, the other counterparties would put the firm into bankruptcy and that would cause the whole firm to fail. That, that's the unfortunate choice we don't have. If we step in to support a systemic institution, all of their customers, all of their counterparties benefit, whether we like it or okay. not. So if the taxpayer, it's their taxpayer money, it's the shareholder money, and you believe they have a right to know how taxpayer and shareholder money is being used, nevertheless, you are accepting allowing AIG to decide what we'll know, when we'll know it, and under what terms. Well, uh, forgive me, sir. As I mentioned, I think that Treasury can work with the Federal Reserve, uh, work with the company. But why haven't they done it? I mean, it, uh, there's a lot of money out the door. A lot of time has passed. And if they're going to do it, why wouldn't they have done it before the money's out the door rather than after the fact? Well, Chair, uh, Congressman, it's a good question. I think that we are we're fighting a lot of fires at the same time. And this is a very important issue, and we'll, well, I, I hear the know, feedback. With all due respect, there is unanimous agreement, I think, on both sides of the aisle that we want to know how the money is being spent. Uh, there is an acknowledgment on your part that that will give the taxpayer some basis to have confidence that we are doing something that really is a pretty bitter pill to swallow, uh, but we are doing it for a good reason. The gentleman's time has expired, but uh, Mr. Yeah, uh, back. Thank you. No, Mr. Cash Carey, if you want to respond briefly, and then we're going to go to Mr. Fortenberry. <coughs> well, again, Congressman, and, I thank you for the comment. You know, we got the message. Uh, we'll look into it, sir. Let, let me say to Mr. Uh, Welch, uh, we are going to, on the uh, second panel, we are going to get into some specifics about how the money has actually been spent. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Fortenberry for his five minutes, and then we, we will recess. Mr. Fortenberry. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, for appearing today. I'm sure there are other ways and easier ways you can make a living. And so I do want to say from the outset I appreciate your professionalism and dedication to public service during these difficult times and in spite of the tensions around these policies. Thank you. Uh, there is an article in today's Omaha World Herald. It's basically the headline. It says, Banks Remain Strong, referring to our local banks despite profit decline. And the director of our banking system in Nebraska says, on average, they're very soundly operated. Now, these are fundamentally local banks, not the outside banks that are there. But an editorial comment before I start the questioning. It, I, I believe it is th these local institutions, mainly owned by local families, that have proximity to their portfolio obligations, which by their very nature then are more transparent as well as accountable. And I think that's a lesson that we need to think through as we look at uh, the entire systemic crises, difficulties, mm -hmm. however you want to term it. In, in that regard, as I said in my er earlier statement, and I appreciate the Chairman's intent to unpack this further, perhaps later, and maybe we will see you again, are the, are our is our financial system, are our financial institutions too consolidated? You have nine banks now with approximately 50 percent of all deposited assets in this country. Uh, five banks, if I recall correctly, hold about 37 percent. Are we vulnerable for because of that reason? I think we clearly are. Look where we are today. Look at the actions we've had to take to support systemic institutions. There's no question that we must undergo as a country very thoughtful regulatory reform to look at what our financial system should look like in the future to make sure that we're not here again. There's no question. Uh, you know, there, there are benefits to scale, but when the costs, because these institutions get to be so big, are then going to be borne by the taxpayers, that's a real problem. I appreciate that insight. Now, let me lose, move to a second, more specific question. Uh, it's my understanding that Goldman Sachs, the recipient of about $10 billion in TARP funds, actually repurchased their own stock to the tune of $2 billion last December. Now, earlier you had said this is a prohibited activity. Can you explain? Sure. Um, I don't have the details of the, uh, of the Goldman transaction. My understanding of it, because I think the chairman put out some data on this in the last few days, is that in the case of Goldman, my understanding is those were stocks that were repurchased over the course of the year but reported at the end of the year is my understanding. We've put in place restrictions. They cannot buy back their stock. The only way they can buy back their stock is if it's part of a normal, ongoing uh, 
share plan for their employees. So if they want to incentivize, if some of these banks incentivize their employees with, let's say, restricted stock, and they want to maintain their share count, we enabled that one carve out. So if you want to incentivize your employees over the long term, then you can buy back the shares that are only those shares that are associated with the long term uh, compensation agreements. That's the only place where firms under the capital purchase program are able to buy back their stock. Is that exception consistent with what happened with Goldman Sachs? In that case, I don't know, because my understanding of that, and I haven't looked at it in detail, but I can, my understanding is the bulk of those share repurchases were done before Treasury became an investor in Goldman Sachs. And so those would have, been, because it happened before we went in, it would not be subject to our The gentleman would yield. That's my understanding, too. Is that right? Okay. All right. Thank you. The third question is related to uh, Mr. Welsh's question as well. Please explain how extensively you actually review the books of these companies receiving TARP funds. We review applications as they apply to the TARP. So they have an application that they submit to their regulator. The regulator, in many cases, has been regulating these institutions for many years. For the large institutions, the regulators are physically on site. The regulators look at all of the data they have on these institutions and prepare a recommendation to Treasury. We then review that, tre that recommendation from the regulator and the data they provide us, and we review the application in making our decision on whether or not to invest. Uh, and I can walk you through that decision process if you're interested. For the vast majority of banks, ongoing review. Ongo for, for the vast majority of banks, you know, I mentioned we've invested in 489 banks so far, 30 more, 40 more each week. We do not go in and do ongoing, uh, going through their books. Again, we've taken a policy perspective that the vast majority of these are healthy, well-run institutions. We just want them to make good commercial decisions and extend loans in their communities. It's it's the one-off cases that we've had to go in and look at a lot of detailed analytics around their financial position, their balance sheet, et cetera, when determining are they systemic, do we need to step in, how much do we need to step in. Can, can you name those institutions and then how frequently you are doing this review? Well, in the one-off cases, it's been the auto companies, the auto finance companies, uh, AIG, Citigroup, Bank of America are the one-off cases that we've had. We've done something extraordinary. In each case, we've gone in in a lot of detail. Remember, with the regulators, the regulators are on site. They're the ones sending us regular updates on what's happening at the banks, what's happening with their portfolios. So, so they're et embedded. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, may I ask unanimous consent to ask Mr. Keshkar just two questions, not to be answered right now, but since you have the whole day, uh, if McKee gives you a card uh, on that, you can make Mr. Keshkar come back. Pardon? Are you going to make Mr. Kishkar? Mr. Kishkar has agreed to come back. Okay, uh, fine. The chair is declaring a recent Uh, in the next panel, we're going to hear from uh, some specifics on the use of TARP funds, and we're going to hear on the third panel from the Inspector uh, General for the Troubled Assets Relief Program. So stay tuned. Uh, recess for one half hour. Thank you. Thank you. The will come to order. I'm going to uh, begin a second round of questioning of uh, Mr. Kashkari. Thank you for remaining here, and uh, if uh, necessary, we'll have a third round. We will soon be going to the second and third panels, and I appreciate the patience of all of the witnesses, and I appreciate the uh, continued presence of, uh, of all members, and the uh, House is just finishing up on votes. I expect we'll have uh, some more questions. I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like to begin, uh, Mr. Kashgari, uh, and point out that you're familiar that GAO has testified, uh, and will testify today, that they are still concerned about the TARP's inability to track the use of TARP funds, and that the challenges are going to grow as the TARP programs grow. The Special Inspector General will testify today that, and I quote, if by percentage terms some of the estimates of fraud in recent government programs apply to the TARP programs, 
we are looking at the potential exposure of hundreds of billions of dollars in taxpayer money lost to fraud, unquote, and that is a direct quote. Can you, Mr. Kashgari, point to anything Treasury is currently doing to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse of funds from the uh, CPP program? Uh, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> um, first, uh, as I mentioned previously, we rely very heavily on the regulators when assessing banks in, who have applied to invest for funds. So the banks, excuse me, the banks apply to the regulators. Regulators make a recommendation to Treasury. The regulators have been regulating these institutions in most cases for years. In some cases they have people on site. Isn't it, isn't it true, though, that regulators look for uh, fraud? They don't look for waste and abuse? I, I think the regulators look at the entire business operations to look at how well managed the banks are. But what you're saying TARP doesn't look at it. You defer to the regulators. We, we work closely with the regulators, sir. But, but TARP, you work closely with it. But your mission, as you see it, isn't to look for this. Is that right? Uh, our mission is isn't to look for waste, fraud, and abuse. We want to use the taxpayers' dollars efficiently and protect the taxpayers. And so we, we do it a number of different ways. In part, we do it in concert with the regulators. In part, we put contractual provisions in governing what banks can do and cannot do. But, but you don't look at uses. That, that's what I'm trying to get to. I, I really am looking at the function of the TARP here. You know, we, we understand that you've taken this responsibility on and that you've agreed to stay to help with the transition. I understand that. We're trying to understand the systemic situation here because if we don't know that Treasury is currently doing something to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse from funds from the CPP program, and we don't know for sure that, you, that, the, that your operation is looking at it, then how can, and the question comes, how can, how can you find fraud if you don't know how they're using the money? Does that is that a fair question? It, it, of course, it's a fair question, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Let me get, just give an example of some of the compliance procedures we've built in. We have procedures that we're putting in place where CEOs must certify to Treasury that the statements they make to Treasury are correct, that they're I, I, meeting. I, I got the procedures. I just want to, you know, I, and, I, and excuse me for interrupting you, sure. but I, I got two minutes left. Uh, I understand that Treasury is doing its best to understand impact. And I'm sure you are aware of GAO skepticism that you'll be, uh, that you'll whether or not you're going to be able to do it. But as you know, promoting financial stabilization is only one of two goals of the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act. The other is public accountability. I'd like to read from a legal memo prepared by the Congressional Research for this hearing, and I call my colleagues' attention to this. According, and, and I move to put the entire memorandum in, in, uh, in the record of this hearing. According to, to this memorandum from uh, Congressional Research, this is a quote, given, I go on to say, the objective of ensuring that the authorities and facilities provided to the Secretary of Treasury, that is the TARP funds, are used in a manner that, quote, maximizes overall returns to taxpayers, inner quotes, and provides, inner quotes, public accountability, the internal control system that TARP is required to establish arguably should include monitoring how those funds are being used by recipients. It goes on to say, therefore, it appears that TARP overseers will need to gather information on at least those recipients' major financial transactions, particularly in those areas that have been the primary areas of concern, executive compensation, payment of dividends, purchase of other banks, and certain types of marketing <coughs> promotions. This, of course, means naming rights, for instance, which uh, is uh, you know, mentioned in a memo. At this time, does Treasury at least gather information on recipients, major financial transactions on an individually identifiable basis? Uh, Chairman, may I provide a thorough answer, sir? Is, can you give me a yes or no, though? Well, we do not ask for transaction okay. by transaction so you do, data. So the answer is no. The, but I'd like to, if I may, sir, I'd like to provide a thorough response. Okay, you can respond, and then my time has expired, and then we'll go to Mr. Jordan, but we're going to come back on this question. Thank you, sir. Uh, the internal control provision that you're referring to in the law, I have it in front of me. 
uh, specifies that Treasury shall establish an effective system of internal controls. We have PricewaterhouseCoopers working with us developing the internal controls within Treasury. We have spoken with both the GAO, the Special IG, and Treasury's own uh, analysis. This provision about the use of TARP resources is about Treasury's use of TARP resources. The law does not direct us to uh, impose internal controls over the 500 banks that we've invested in, just to be precise. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to. I'll, I'll come back to that thank in the next round of questioning. Uh, we're going to go to Mr. Uh, Jordan. Thank Mr. You, Jordan, Jordan, you're recognized yeah, for five minutes. Mr. Kashkari, I want to go back to where I was about an hour and a half ago with with this this whole concept. And again, I was one of the individuals who did not vote for the the uh, the TARP program back uh, last fall. But here's what I'm trying to understand. You, you know, you're a sharp guy. Um, Tim Geithner is a sharp guy. Hank Paulson is a sharp guy. Ben Bernanke is a smart guy. H how was it that um, back in October, October 3rd, that all of you were convinced and, and the package was uh, sold to the Congress that you were going to be able to, wh what did you think then that was going to allow you to go after the toxic assets, the troubled assets, that since then you haven't been able to do? I mean, it, it was this assurance that members got the public got, the taxpayers got, that you could in fact clear the bad stuff out and things would get moving back towards normal, and yet now, five months later, still not there. So tell me what you, what you thought you knew but yet found out you didn't really know. Walk me through that again if you can. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to. When we went to the Congress, you're right, we talked about and the plan was to purchase mortgage-related assets in large volumes to get those markets moving again. Uh, the crisis intensified so much just in the few, in just in the two weeks we were negotiating with Congress and the one or two weeks that followed that we had to move even faster. Dollar for dollar, putting a dollar of capital in goes much further, as you would, I'm sure understand with leverage, than just buying a dollar of assets. So we had to take the most aggressive action we could to stabilize the system. So that's why we ended up leading with capital. Mm -hmm. Now, for an asset purchase program to work, it must be done in very, very large scale. Once we concluded in the fall that we had to allocate almost half of the money for a capital program and we had these one-off contingencies that we had to deal with, we were left with fewer resources and the question was, would, if we only spent half the money on asset purchases, would it be big enough in light of the $14 trillion residential and commercial mortgage market? What Secretary Geithner has done is saying, look, let's take the available resources, let's combine it with the private sector and leverage it up so we can increase our purchasing power and go make a big dent on a very big market. And so it's just, it's about speed of implementation, mm -hmm. it's about impact, and it's about scale with which to go at the problem. Let me ask you another question. Uh, and and uh, talking with some folks, reading about this, this phenomenon, uh, would you uh, agree that the mark-to-market concept is, is good in, in the, in the in the framework of disclosure, but not so good in, 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 a, uh, in the context of, of, in the regulatory context. Is, is, and, it, and if so, are there some reforms we can do that kind of fit that statement that are going to help us as we move forward? I think the mark-to-market issue has a lot of benefits, and I think it is good in terms of disclosure for investors. But keep in mind, right now we have an environment where investors are questioning the value and the meaning of regulatory capital standards. Mm -hmm. And so if we said, well, there's going to be one set of standards for the books that the investors get to see, but don't worry, there's a, there's a, a different set of standards for regulators to use, that may not support more confidence for investors as they look at the institutions. I think mark-to-market is a very important issue. I know the SEC has recently done a study on it, and I think we need to look at it as we go you about regulatory reform. You personally, reform. What, what, what do you think if any changes can be made to that, to the mark-to-market um, rule, that can be positive. Uh, well, let me go back. Do you do you agree that there's there's some potential with what I just described, mark-to-market in a disclosure sense, but uh, some some amending in the, in the regulatory context? I think that that is something that's worth looking at. I'll tell you, I'm probably not the best. There are better experts than me, on. Uh, the accounting treatment of mark to market versus accrual accounting, for example, and in the regulatory context. I think that these are things we should look at, but I, especially in the middle of the crisis that we're in, mm -hmm. I think we should be cautious about making changes that seem like a good idea at the time. I think we need to get through this crisis. We need to have a thoughtful discussion 
analyze these issues, and then make the long-term changes that we need to make. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, Chair recognize Mr. Tierney. Thank you. Thanks for coming back, Mr. Kishkari. We appreciate it. Um, earlier we talked about the fact that uh, you're going to have these partnerships that are going to be partly with taxpayer money and partly with other investors going out and getting the bad assets. And I mentioned that some of them might be hedge fund people that taxpayers might think we're getting benefited after already doing things that cause part of the problem. And you said that you thought instead that most of the money would come from pensions or other investors. So given the fiduciary responsibilities of uh, people that run these pension funds and given the stressed nature of these troubled assets, what is the sales pitch that you're going to make to them to think that they can invest in them and still meet their fiduciary responsibility? Because now I know there are a lot of people that have an interest in those pensions are going to be sitting out there going, oh, my God, that's what, where our money is going to go? Um, well, thanks for providing me the opportunity to follow up. <clears throat> if you look at pension plans, big pension plans, and retirement programs for teachers or, or government workers or employees, they allocate different parts of that money to different classes of investments. They'll allocate some to government securities, some to equities, some to alternative asset classes such as private equity or even hedge funds. And those are typically much smaller asset classes, much smaller segments. So it would not surprise me to see major pension funds saying, okay, we're going to put a small slice of this towards real estate assets or mortgage-related assets because we think the, tr the prices over the long term are, are attractive. And so I don't want to give anybody the impression that huge pockets of people's pension plans are going to be put at this. But I think if you look at the amount of savings we have as a country, retirement savings, small slices can add up to big dollars. Okay. So you're basically saying to them that it's, it'll be a good investment for that small slice to go in and buy these toxic assets. So you, with your other investments, one little slice of it ought to go toward really troubled assets. I think that that's a, that's a reasonable position that portfolio managers are going to be looking at and, and analyzing as they make their decisions. Okay. Um, all right. I, I would think that you might get some of the hedge funds to do it, but I think people, unless they can see a bigger upside on, on that, it, it's going to be a stretch for them to do that. Uh, can you, just following up on another question that was asked earlier about AIG, and Mr. Welch had asked about uh, can't we favor uh, those in, uh, people that AIG is dealing with as co-partners or whatever over a uh, certain other group that uh, maybe ought not to be favored as much. You said, well, if we do that, if we discriminate with one set of people against another, then the remaining people can bring the company into bankruptcy. You explain to us how it is that they're able to do that, or I'll do that. And secondly, what would be the consequences of AIG's bankruptcy? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> if I have a contract with a financial institution and that financial institution just des decides not to honor my contract, I have recourse. I can sue them uh, as a creditor. Uh, I don't know the different legal requirements. Uh, a group of creditors could come together and say, okay, you haven't honored your obligation to me. You may have paid off your policyholders, but you haven't honored your commitments to me. I'm going to go to the courts to try to get my money, and which may end up pushing the company in bankruptcy, uh, et cetera. So again, this is something that, as I indicated earlier, nobody wanted to do. But the unfortunate consequence of bailing out an institution is you help everybody in the institution, you really don't get to pick or choose. Now, if we had allowed AIG to go into bankruptcy, uh, not only would potentially, AIG has 30 million policyholders in the U.S., 30 million. Not only could those policyholders be put at risk, but all of the businesses that AIG provides insurance for, all of their business customers around the world, I think they operate in more than 100, com in 100 countries, could all be uh, exposed to some type of financial risk. Uh, there could be various collateral calls from other institutions. And so the, the judgment was not we like AIG or we want to help AIG. It was the system as a whole could be put at risk if this were allowed to go into bankruptcy, especially at a time when the financial markets are still uh, in a state of low confidence. And your, your feeling is that all 30 million of those people would lose their policies, that the businesses would all go under, that this whole thing would be such a tragedy you couldn't, you couldn't risk it, or that you just have an uncertainty that nobody wants to risk? I think that there's a large uncertainty and the downside, the risks of the downside are much larger than even the large dollars that we're having to spend to support the institution. I don't want to suggest that everybody's policies would be gone. I think that's an overstatement. Mm -hmm. But I think that there'd be a lot of risk for everybody uh, that is a customer or a counterparty or a partner of AIG in any, in any respect. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Souter, you may proceed for five minutes. 
<clears throat> I wanted to follow up again on some credit questions. Uh, that uh, I have 58% uh, of the RV market in the country in my district. I have the Silverado and Sierra uh, biggest GM pickup plant. Uh, and I need the credit opened up. And I wanted to illustrate a, a couple of different things. Uh, uh, Congressman uh, Donnelly DeFazio and I had a, uh, an amendment uh, to the car, truck, motorcycle that included RVs on retail floor plan financing. Uh, because part of the problem in retail floor plan financing, and let me deal with the RV, the auto has a similar, is, is that there were basically three major companies that did it, Textron, GE Capital. They pulled out. You can't sell anything if you can't get it to a dealer. That, uh, that these are fairly large purchases, particularly for, for motorhomes, and nobody would take the market. So we tried to get a tranche set. It, it, it was, didn't pass the Senate. It was a House advisory. Uh, and that the similar, one of the problems here is, is that in American manufacturing, because of legacy costs, because of health and pension and our wage rate, we make bigger vehicles. The smaller stuff tends not to be American made. So they require bigger and longer term investments. Let me give you one illustration. In one lot in a major city in the south, they tried to have, clear their lot of some of the uh, RVs and motorhomes. That the, uh, they sold eight, which was not a good sale day. Uh, of those eight, two were in the 350 to 500,000 range. Uh, four were in the uh, 100 to 250 range, and two were used towables under 25,000. All had credit scores, the buyers, of over 700. Only one was actually financed, and it was a $15,000 used towable. The reason is, is that they, nobody wants to take a 15-year, $500,000 mortgage right now, uh, partly going back to the mark-to-market -market question, which I need to point out assumes that you're going to liquidate the premise underneath it. So the combination of the retail floor financing and the lack of for bigger purchases is hammering the car, auto, truck, RV markets. And unless we can figure out how to get some liquidity into that system, Fleetwood declared bankruptcy this morning. Uh, they're going all over the place. It's spilling into manufactured housing. Uh, and, and we try to address a little of the housing in, in the, with housing credits. But this is a, a huge double problem, compounded by, and one other thing I wanted to, to raise to you as you look at how to handle this, that there are buybacks, which the auto companies are starting to get into, but the RV industry, that aren't on their books. They've never had a problem before because when one dealer can't sell it, they move it to another dealer. But if they can't get retail floor planning, all of a sudden this stuff is coming back, out they go. Uh, thousands of people being laid off when, in fact, there appears to be some market. How do we open that credit market up if they don't know in the lending institutions what their assets are? That's why we keep bringing up a variation of mark to market. Uh, Congressman, thank you. This is a huge issue. It is a huge issue that we are, we have teams of people working on. And this goes back to the new facility under the Consumer and Business Lending Initiative. It's called the TALF program that the Federal Reserve has set up. It's going to start funding in a couple weeks. It's, it's ready now. It's finally launched. That's going to specifically bring down costs of borrowing for auto loans, for credit cards, for student loans, for small business loans. Right now, as a starting point, it's a $200 billion facility. We have a plan to increase it to a trillion dollar facility and to add other asset classes. So we are looking at all different sorts of asset classes to see what else we can put in there to get liquidity to the markets so that people can buy motorhomes and RVs and cars and trucks, et cetera, uh, until we get through this crisis. So I assure you, Congressman, we are focused on this too. We get the same calls you get, not as many as you get because it's your district, but we get the same calls you get. We know it's a real problem and we think we're on the right track to bring down these borrowing costs because who can go afford today and buy a car and pay a 14 or 15 percent loan? No one's going to do it. We need to bring these rates down so that our businesses can continue to do business. And there, and there needs to be some kind of addressing of this uh, size volume 
of, of loan and length of loan question. Uh, some of the RV people had talked to me initially about could they pool but with a, a, a fee such that to help share if some went bad. Uh, there's got to be some kind of risk sharing on the longer term and sizable loans or that market will not free up. And, and those tend to be our American manufacturers because we're skewed to the higher value ends. And uh, those big areas, construction and auto truck, I believe are close to 50 percent of much of our uh, American uh, hmm. economy. The retail sales, if you, if you take uh, a manufacturing job or value added, which could be software or whatever, is going to circulate different at a different rate in a productivity and multiplier effect than a service job or a uh, labor intensive job. And that sector is overwhelmingly tied to construction and auto. And it yeah. tends to go boom bust. But the way the, the financial markets have collapsed so deeply, it's not clear how we get it restarted, especially if the uh, debt that the government's taking on starts to crowd out private borrowing and private equity. They're going to be, and mark to markets chewing them up, which was a change. Uh, it's not a, when you say it's a problem changing back, it was a change to it that partly triggered this. Uh, that that uh, it, it's not clear how we reopen the credit market because well, capital is going to be so tight. Well, Congressman, we think the new facility that the Fed has set up is going to help restart not just the market and get rates down, but bring private capital back because the way it's designed, it's designed that the private sector puts in capital, the government lends to it, gets the markets going again, and then our hope is as the credit markets heal themselves that the private sector will be able to go back and then the government can step back, can step away. So we're focused on this. The only other thing I would add, don't forget the administration has an auto task force, a whole team of people focused just on the autos to try to get them to a place of long-term viability. And so there's a team working there, Treasury, it's an interagency program looking at autos, looking at auto suppliers, looking at some of their financing constraints as well. So we're coming at it from both directions. I think the gentleman uh, chair recognizes Mr. Cummings. Mr. Kashkari, um, the um, you know there are, there are a lot of banks that that are returning their money. Is that right? They want to return the money. Yes. And they apparently want to return this TARP money because of restrictions and the things that you talked about a little bit earlier that the Obama administration is um, demanding and the public is demanding. Um, how do you feel about that? I'm just curious. I mean, in, just in a few words, because I got some other things I want to ask sure. you. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned because in many cases the banks that want to return the money or we've got 200 banks that we've approved that have said no thank you. And in most cases the ones that are saying no thank you or who express an interest to return are the strongest, healthiest of our institutions. Those are the very ones we want to take more capital because they're in the best position to extend credit. And so I, I understand, well, in any case. Well, now, now that leads me to something else now. Um, so they're the stronger, the stronger banks. They want to give the money back because they don't want to go uh, abide by the Obama and rules, President Obama's rules, and it seems like then they, they should be in a better position, particularly if they had the money, to make the loans. And so it sounds like they are more, they might be more interested in continuing to operate as usual, as opposed to seeing our economy come out of this great slump that we're in. I'm just curious. <clears throat> it's, a, it's, a tough, it's a tough problem to answer with precision because, yeah. as I indicated earlier, 60 percent of our credit is from banks, 40 percent is non-banks. I know the 40 percent is not wa working right now. We're trying to get that going. If you look at the lending survey that we did do, which covers the majority of the banks in the country in terms of dollars, lending has held up remarkably well. A lot of banks, especially the smaller banks, will say they're just scared because they're hearing so much noise out of Washington, they're saying, do I really need the, the headache of taking this additional money? I know if I took additional money, I could put it to work, but there's so much coming out of Washington right now. They're calling us and saying, you know what? No, thank you. I just, I don't know, I don't know what's coming, and so no thank you. And so we're disappointed by that because we want 
the strongest banks to take more money because they can turn around and extend credit. So you already said in your statement that you didn't feel that uh, public officials like you have any business telling banks how to lend because they're in a better position to do it, to, to make those determinations. And I don't know how you can say that with a straight face. After all, a lot of these banks uh, did some poor decision making well, and got us into this mess. And so I'm just wondering, and I, and I know about that latitude that you talked about, but I'm wondering this new, the new program that you're talking about with regard to the auto loans and freeing up the money, how does that work? And how might that have effect on banks negatively or positively? Um, this, this program is a Federal Reserve, we call it a facility, where the Fed says they will lend money to people who buy securities. So new securities, a bunch of auto loans are packaged together, they meet certain standards, an investor wants to buy those securities, they can get a loan from the Federal Reserve to buy those securities. The investor has to put in some of their own money. Gotcha. And then they'll have that for up to three years. And so it enables private capital to come off the sidelines to get money into these markets with the federal government providing some of the lending to those investors. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it is complicated, but the market, the investors have said they really want it. And you know, the, the car companies and the student loan companies and the small business companies have all said this, is, this should really help them by bringing down rates for borrowers. At the end of the day, this program is all about bringing down rates for our consumers. And how does that affect the banks? Well, the banks in this case. What, what's your hope? The banks in this case are not, it's not the main priority of this program. This program is about getting lending to consumers. The banks have a role to play because they're the ones who buy all these auto loans, package them up, and then sell them to investors. So the banks have a role, but this is not about the banks extending credit. This is about getting credit going from the non-banking market to the, to the consumers and to the car buyers. I got you. I got you. And so, so but I was just wondering if, if this then establishes some kind of competition. In other words, these are people who are borrowing money from a non-bank. Correct. And so I'm just wondering how much competition that uh, gives to the banks and whether that spurs any activity possible. Well, I, I think it's a good thing. I mean, I think you may, you you may the, respond uh, and, and then uh, uh, the gentleman's time has expired, you, but please respond. Thank you, Chairman. I think the more diverse sources we have of credit in our economy, the better we're going to be. And so we need to get the non-banking market going. Uh, we need the banks to do more, but we really need to get the non-banking market going. That's where the big hole is right now. And so we need all of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to go to round three. Uh, Mr. Kaskari, picking up where we left off, you said that Treasury's internal controls need apply only to Treasury and not to the banks that have sold equity to Treasury. Uh, now, yes, Congressman. I'm referring to the internal control provision in the I ESO. I understand, but I, I would uh, gently remind you that that view is somewhat extreme, that it's, it's at odds with legal analysis of your duties to monitor the use of TARP funds uh, by the banks that got them. Uh, C CRS has, uh, has spoken to this directly, and it's not alone. The GAO is also of the opinion that your legal duty is to monitor the use of TARP funds by the banks which receive them. It seems to me that you may be alone in the view that Congress didn't mean what it said in Section 116 of the EESA. We told you in there that we wanted Treasury to safeguard the TARP monies from waste and abuse. That is the meaning of the incorporation of the Federal Manager's Financial Integrity Act, Title 31, Section 3512C. And I think that you are taking a position that is not tenable and one that is pointedly lacking in uh, responsibility for the office that, that you hold. And uh, that is that you just say it's not your job. Now, uh, granted, you have come in under extraordinary circumstances. But we have a new administration coming in. And I'm hopeful they're going to take a fresh look at this law 
And uh, if you want to comment on what I said, you'd feel free to, and then I've got some follow-up. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, we take protecting taxpayers' money extraordinarily seriously, extraordinarily seriously. What I was referring to is the, you know, the section you're referring to, the internal control provision of the ESA. I personally spoke with the GAO and the Special Inspector General about their interpretation of this, and they agreed with me, and you'll hear from them on the third panel, they agreed with our assessment that this internal control provision is talking about Treasury's own internal controls within Treasury, and we've, we're working, we've made a lot of progress on our own internal controls. So you're controls. saying that, that you, you publicly acknowledge that you have a responsibility for the internal controls of the TARP funds once they go to the banks? No, no, I'm saying we have a responsibility for internal controls within the Treasury organization, and we have responsibilities to the taxpayers to make sure the money is used appropriately and in the best policy interests of the country. But the internal control provision is very narrowly focused. That doesn't mean we don't have to protect the taxpayers. We have other mechanisms for Are protecting the taxpayers. Are you saying Congress was not uh, specific enough in its uh, charge to, to you? Uh, I've been advised, and Congressman, or Chairman, forgive me, I'm not an attorney. I've been advised by our lawyers at Treasury that Section 3512C of Title 31, United States Code, is specifically about internal procedures within federal government agencies. And, and that's what we're referring to. That's what the law refers to right here on line 16. Uh, we're going to hear more about this point in the third panel. We don't think it's arcane. We think it relates directly to your responsibilities when we began this day talking about how banks who got TARP funds are moving the money out of the country. Uh, it's, it's my opinion, and apparently the opinion of some members of this panel, uh, that there should be accountability from the Treasury Department as to, as to U.S. taxpayers' funds being spent by TARP recipients in, in other countries, especially when we have such dire straits here. Now, in the time that I, that I have remaining on this uh, particular round, uh, I want to uh, talk about the, the impact of the uh, TARP funds. Uh, Congress has heard repeatedly the representations of large TARP recipients about the billions of dollars of new credit they're creating. They're eager to tell the side of the story, and you've repeated them today. You state on page 10 of your testimony that all loan amounts appear to be going up. But the lending is much reduced compared to the period before the crisis. Isn't that so? Yes, as I indicated. Oh, okay. okay, please. But then what about the other side of the picture? Are you collecting data from the banks on the contraction of existing credit that is occurring now? This goes to some of the questions Mr. Souders raised. Where have you shown the decline in credit due to foreclosures and a suspension of credit lines that our constituents are experiencing? How do those numbers compare to past periods? And, Mr. Kashkar, if the new credit doesn't more than offset the extinction of existing credit, does the economy experience a net positive effect from credit activities or a net negative effect? And do you have a, if you can respond to that, and my time has expired. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, there's no question that in recessions, credit levels fall because both lenders and borrowers are nervous about taking on new obligations and extending credit. There's no question about that. And when we look at the lending levels that we're seeing, we know that they're higher than they would have been absent the TARP funds. We think they've held up remarkably well in light of the severe economic contraction we had in Q4. But again, as I look at the, the broader credit problem, the banking sector is part of it. A much bigger problem at this point is the securitization market, the non-banking sector. So banking is not as high as we'd like it to be. Securitization is zero. And it was 40 percent before this started. So we need to get that going, too. Yeah, I, my time's expired. I just want to comment that um, there is no time in the history of this country have we ever had a period where we was, we're in a recession and there's massive amounts of federal dollars by the time this thing is through, maybe trillions of federal dollars going in to prop up the economy, and where's the money going in terms of a net new credit uh, to report to us? Uh, Mr. Souter. I want to uh, continue along this a, a little bit. Clearly because of Enron, we, we had to look at what I guess is called uh, uh, fair value measurements, which is mark to market. Um, and that uh, the, the challenge here that we have, because that went in in November 2007. So to talk about a change, it appears to be one of the changes that helped trigger the credit crisis, uh, with all due, due respect, because it exposed those who were not fair marketed value and then caused a panic beyond that, because it was a broad swipe at everybody's valuation, when in fact 
in areas of the country like mine, we had been having 2 3% growth, not 100% growth in housing. Uh, the national went up 200% while the economy is growing about 3. It doesn't take a rocket scientist, it takes business 101 to see you've got a mismatch. But that mismatch was not universal. So we did a universal solution that in particular, and I'm fascinated because the more you read, the more you study about this, there's been a major changing in finances in the country in securitization and moving outside the Fed regulated and into this 40% other sector that you're talking about. Yet the banks are tightly regulated and we slam fair market measurements on them. Now if we fund the securitization group, getting to Mr. Cummings' question, are they going to have to play by the same rules as banks? And then, if they have to do fair market measurements, we're right back to, to where we were. There's got to be some kind of addressing an underlying concern. But let me first ask, in this trying to get the 40 percent securitization, are they going to come on? That was where the biggest problem were, was. Are they going to come, if they're going to compete on loans, are they going to come in under similar banking rules? <coughs> some of them are converting to banks. Correct. Uh, some, some uh, is this going to be a mandatory thing? Is there going to be a supervisory? This is where transparency starts to become a huge deal because if the problem sector really, for the most part, it was not a bank, it was a division of a bank to compete with this 40 percent. Yeah, the 40 percent uh, part is made up of a lot of different types of institutions. So you've got, uh, you know, big banks like CIT, non-banks, excuse me, like CIT or GE Capital, et cetera. You have uh, pension plans, insurance companies who need to buy assets to match their liabilities. Um, you have various kind of funds all around the world. So there's, you can't, it's hard to define them as one category because there's all sorts of dogs and cats investing in the non-bank market and buying these securities. And most of them, to my understanding, are, in many cases, they are marking those securities to market. And so they do see the asset prices go up and down. So I think your points have a lot of merit. I would say the one other point in terms of accounting and transparency that's been at the root cause of this problem is it's been almost impossible to peer into these mortgage-backed securities to figure out which loans are in there, who wrote the loans, how are they doing. And because investors had a hard time peering into the mortgage-backed securities, let alone the CDOs when they were bundled together, they didn't know which mortgages were good, which securities were bad, so they pulled back from all of them. And that's, that's an example where in, like in your district, the, where their home prices didn't take it off, they're take suffering. Too much time. Uh, we've had multiple hearings here, reading about countrywide and so on. That basically, if you were paying six percent, there was less risk than if you were paying fourteen. When you start to see the high rates of return beyond the normal rates of return, the, you know, uh, the, the, I think it's Eric Paulson who made the three point seven billion. John uh, John Paulson. That John. Yeah. Uh, that um, when he was here, and I asked him a similar question, he said, "How do you think I made my money?" Uh, that, that he could see this, anybody who was studying it could figure out which ones were inflated and which ones weren't. It, it, it wasn't like that confused. It was sloppiness. People wanted the high returns uh, there, that you had to either be in pharmaceutical speculation, energy speculation, or housing speculation if you're getting higher than 6 or 8 percent. And that, that pension funds may have done that. I, I just, I'm not very tolerant of, of the, the people who say, oh, we couldn't figure out what was going on. We need more transparency but they weren't paying close enough attention. But in, the, in this uh, non-bank financial uh, sector, in, in, in trying to, to monitor how, how they're doing, I have, I have Lincoln Financial in my district, the center of the annuities of the country. They bought a bank because they're now applying for TARP funds. Uh, and we saw a number of others convert to banks. But you suggested that the Federal Reserve is setting up a separate fund that won't require them to be like a bank. Correct. So the, 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 the new program that the Fed has set up, the Treasury supporting, to get lending going, it's many, many financial participants can use it. who's going to regulate them and what guidelines are they going to have and are there going to be similar regulations? Because while we're all in Congress obsessed about the banking sector, you're telling us that there's a 40 percent and, and the Fed is floating out $2 trillion while we're dealing with $700 billion in your fund. So the Fed and Treasury have designed very important pr procedures and restrictions to make sure we know the quality of the collateral that we're going to be getting. Because when the Fed loans in this new program, they're going to get the securities as collateral. So it's only going to be new loans, new securitizations in this, in this current program. 
and very strict guidelines in terms of what's eligible to make sure that we protect the taxpayers. There's not with it per se going to be new regulations that go for the people who are lending money into that system, but we're making sure the taxpayers are protected. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> um, you've painted for us a very um, stark picture in terms of what we have in front of us, and that is we have the uncertainty of the markets um, and yet we have the necessity to act quickly. Um, we're going to be confronted with the just choice as to how to put a, uh, an end to this uncertainty by uh, putting up however many more uh, billions of dollars to, to stave off continued um, decline in, in the markets and continued um, um, uh, recession that's going to lead to, to further dislocation of our workers in this country. And the President has spoken very clearly of the need to act now or act later. Um, the question I have for you is, um, given the fungibility that you say, you know, these financial institutions are, are, are involved with, the, with respect to the m world markets, how can we be certain that the dollars that are going to be going into this public-private fund um, are dollars that are going to absolutely mean the end of the uncertainty with respect to those toxic assets when we're part of an international world economy now and, and we want to make sure that whatever final package is the final package and that there isn't going to be another shoe to drop, so to speak. I mean, that's what my constituents want to know. We want closure just as much as the President does. We want to be able to move on. We don't want this recession to drag on any further. And we also don't want to overpay for these toxic assets any more than uh, they, they have to be. But we understand that um, if we let this recession drag on, it's going to cost us a great deal. And I'd ask you to comment on this because I think this is a fundamental point that most economists have been talking about is, you know, what is it that we have to put the staunch to, uh, wrap the tourniquet around, and, and uh, how do we wrap a tourniquet around something that is involved in a global uh, economy in terms of assets? Uh, thank you, Congressman. I'm going to answer your question in two parts. First part, the global nature. Uh, we cannot act alone. So we have our programs. We are consulting closely with our counterparties in other countries who are taking similar measures that are tailor-made for their system. The world leading economies all need to act. And I think that they are acting with different speeds, but they are acting. And we're going to continue to have an active dialogue to encourage all of us to move in a coordinated fashion, number one. Number two, Secretary Geithner's financial stability plan has laid out a broad framework to do this. There's not one piece of it that by itself will solve everything. We have the capital program that he's laid out to make sure our banks have enough capital, even in a worse economic environment, that they can continue to lend. That's very important. That is underway. The details are out there. Number two is the lending program that we talked about, scaling up from $200 billion to a $1 trillion to make sure our consumers and our small businesses can get the credit that they need right now. That's underway. It's going to start funding in a couple weeks. And then third, is the public-private partnership that we just talked about to go after the bad assets. Not one of these tools by itself will be the final, the final solution. We believe these three tools, combined with the other tools that the Fed and other regulators have done, will get at this. Fundamentally, we have a credit crisis that has hurt our economy. And now the economy is, is looping back. It's a vicious cycle, and it's hurting the financial system again. And so we have to go at it from the financial perspective, and then the stimulus bill that the Congress passed and the President signed is also going to be very important to getting the economy going. We need to go at it from both directions. I would say that, um, obviously, as we've heard this morning, transparency. We need to be able to show the American public uh, just how this links to them. And, and I understand the college loans, understand the making payroll in businesses, understand people's vested 
pensions and annuities. But you know, we need to make that even clearer to people because right now uh, that, that case has not been fully made. And until it's fully made, uh, we're not going to be able to come back to the American people and say to them, this is in your interest. Because right now, they don't see it as in their interest. And, uh, and, and there's only one person who can really make that argument. That's the President of the United States. You can't have 535 members of Congress out there trying to explain to the American people how getting this financial system back on track by infusing it with more dollars is going to do this for them when all they're seeing is that, you know, kind of trickle down. They've got to understand that this is a part of the lifeblood of the economy uh, and the lifeblood of our financial system is, the, is one and the same. Um, right now, th that's not becoming very transparent, as you've seen from this hearing. And until that becomes transparent, uh, it's going to be very hard for our, the people's representatives, us, to be able to, to give the President what he needs in order to infuse uh, any more assets into this, uh, uh, into this uh, kind of recovery. So we certainly want this, this uh, to get out of this situation, but we need the really clear, you know, leadership and uh, explanation from the top and the, only the way the President can deliver it. Thank you. General, uh, gentleman's time has expired. Um, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kashkari, you've been as good as your word. It's, uh, it's been quite an afternoon, and I appreciate your time. Uh, one question I have for you. Earlier I asked about, <clears throat> if you will, pushback or influence or advocacy by members of Congress. But now let's switch to the other side. Tell me about the pushback you inherently get or you're getting or resistance you're getting from the mortgage industry, from the banking industry, on m giving you the facts and figures you might need in order to better analyze the underlying assets that we so often call toxic? So far, uh, con Congressman, every time we've asked for data from any recipient banks, they've all complied with us because they know they need to. It's in the country's interest and their interest to comply. Uh, and that's really focused on lending levels, which many people ask us about. And as I said, we're going out to all the institutions uh, to collect the data, not just the top 20. We have not gone out and done a survey of so-called toxic assets per se. I think if we asked them for the data, they would provide it to us. We have, again, we work closely with the regulators who have a lot of this data already. I know that the OCC, the OTS, and the FDIC, for example, collect loan level data from all of their banks and roll that up to look at what's happening in mortgages around the country. So uh, we get the data from different places, partly from the banks, partly from the regulators, as yet, we haven't had any pushback uh, to the data that we've asked for. Okay. Uh, earlier today, uh, there was some talk about loans going to Dubai and China and other places. Isn't it true that the United States is a net debtor around the world? Yes. So if we wanted back all the money that, if you will, we've loaned in, and invested in other places, and the rest of the world did the same in return, wouldn't we suddenly have trillions of dollars of shortfall far beyond what we're putting in with TARP? I believe so, yes. Okay. I just I, I had that impression, a little CNBC and Fox Business News, it seemed that it was that way. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Congressman Kennedy has left, but he talked about certainty, one time, et cetera. From your standpoint, having lived with multiple tranches of different solutions, TARP being one of them, do you think we're well served by having one more, this is it, it encompasses everything, will never seem to come back? Or should we look at smaller uh, steps with more congressional oversight? In other words, do what you think is right, come back to us and tell us what you've done, uh, rather than the $700 billion, which, as by your own admission, really never got used in the original way and will be probably gone before we begin buying those assets in any great numbers. So I, I don't want to say that he was wrong, but wouldn't you say the opposite is true, that, that we should ask for careful and deliberate actions, even if they're not complete, agree to those, authorize you, and then have you come back when you learn more? I think that there's merit in that, I, but I'm, I'm cautious because Sometimes we have to take action that is so unpleasant, but it's so urgent. We just have to move. Sure. And, and, so, and I'm not suggesting little teeny sizes, but 
Uh, the $700 billion, which was 350 350 represented, uh, by your own statement, at least 489 different transactions. So going forward, you don't need a trillion all at once next time, uh, that in fact, although we may authorize and anticipate a trillion, the, the, the periodic reporting that we could expect in a TARP II, uh, and the updates and the increments could in fact be more manageable because we are not dealing with an overnight crisis in which you don't know how much you need to put out, but you might need to put it all out in one day, so to speak. Uh, I think it could be, and I think that this is consistent with the way Secretary Geithner is thinking about it because his new programs, we can get going with the available capital we have. We can assess that they are having the desired effect and then come back and ask, if, if and when he decides to ask for more, do so then. Now I have got a kind of a, a long arm question for you and it is it's a big one and it is a little outside yours. So if you feel uncomfortable completely answering it today, I hope you would come back with your thoughts. Up until now, members of Congress have been saying we have got to put, and, and the administration, two administrations, saying we have to put money in in order to free up mortgages. And I am not dis dissuading anyone today from that view. but. Another scenario, if we hadn't put a penny in to the back end, the banks, and instead we put a hypothetically sufficient amount, whatever it was, into the refinancing of new mortgages so that if a bank said, look, I'm, I'm calling the loan, here's the foreclosure, because as you know, they're, they're not doing foreclosures right now in many cases. They're, people are staying in their homes months and months and months waiting to see what happens. If they had done all the foreclosures and people who could make a monthly payment on a future mortgage had available mortgages, if we facilitated the front end of the new mortgage with trillions of dollars of, of capability, wouldn't we in some ways have marked to market, refinanced, found the good people, renegotiated in much less time than now where we are putting money in? The chairman and others have made the point that it doesn't necessarily seem to be trickling down. We are pushing it on this end, asking it to end up here, rather than saying, do what you think is right and we will take care of people who are credit worthy, whether they are existing homeowners or future homeowners on those foreclosed properties. The gentleman's time has expired, but I would ask uh, if you would answer his question. Uh, thank you. I, I think, uh, Congressman, I think we are doing both. So I think the actions taken to stabilize Fannie and Freddie to make sure that mortgages were still available and FHA is very important. I don't think we could just say, forget the banks, we are just going to start up all new lending programs because we would have no way of administering that. You know, the, the banks, for, for all our, our frustrations, they have thousands of branch offices in all of our communities and they are the tentacles out in to get credit out there. So I think we need to do both providing the government support for the lending, like the new program that I talked about, uh, as well as helping the banks get through this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I, I thank the gentleman. You know, one of the, uh, we're going to go to a fourth uh, round with Mr. Kashgari. Uh, one of the things that I'm concerned about, uh, the Washington Post reports on a public-private partnership. They say the, uh, uh, last week the government is seeking to resuscitate the nation's crippled financial system by forging an alliance with the very outfits that most benefited from the bonanza preceding the collapse of the credit markets, hedge funds and private equity firms. Uh, the article goes on to say that they would be invited to buy up recently issued highly rated securities. These securities finance consumer lending such as credit cards and student and auto loans. The program would involve the government lending nearly $1 trillion. Is this a public-private partnership you are talking about? Yes. Okay. So, uh, in, in this uh, graph that the, uh, in, in some artwork that the Post puts out, they say that um, uh, with government assistance to stimulate purchases of the securities investors borrow from the Fed for $10 million worth, an investor might put up $1 million and borrow $9. And then it says the second part, the public part, the government offers to cover losses if consumers default and the asset-backed security declines in value. And it goes on to say that if the asset-backed security value falls, um, an investor may lose only his original $1 million and the uh, Treasury and the Fed would absorb additional losses, which means that the exposure under this, according to this report, the exposure of uh, uh, the Treasury and the Fed could be as much as 90 percent. Um, now, here's my, here's my question. The Obama budget says that uh, he's put he's put a, um, a marker placeholder of 250 billion dollars, anticipating that would be the losses uh, if uh, if the government goes forward with a 750 billion dollar TARP two. 
Uh, we see uh, that uh, there is a, a discussion among uh, more money going to the FDIC. We know that the, that the amount of losses, according to the President's new budget, is 33 percent estimate. We know that the amount of loss that you had before is around 30 percent. That's what the number that's being thrown, thrown about. Is it possible? that if we go forward with a total of what could be about $3 trillion in TARP funds, rough figure, if the estimated loss would be 30 to 33 percent, we are looking at taxpayers being stuck with $900 to billion to a $1 trillion. Now, Think about this. Every, you know, if you if you'd use three trillion dollars, and you have uh, somebody else could do the math here, but you have 300 million Americans. Is is that like ten thousand dollars per capita? Is that like thirty thousand dollars or more a family that we're into this already? And then you get to this. Check this out. Today's headline: Washington Post. Rays of hope for big banks spur rally on Wall Street. Citigroup uh, apparently is doing some uh, recovery. Uh, and the article says, and this, is, this goes to what Mr. Kennedy raised and what I want to I laser focus on right now. Investors were being dealt more signs yesterday that corporations were shedding more jobs, seen by many as a way for companies to steady themselves during a deepening recession. United Technologies, a large industrial company, said it expects to lay off 11,600 employees. AOL said it's executing a second major round of layoffs, shedding 10 percent of its workforce. I'm from Cleveland. Our economy has been falling apart. We've got foreclosures everywhere. The subprime loan bandits have capitalized in my city and crushed neighborhoods in my city. Where our steel mills in trouble, we have auto plants that are in trouble, and, and the banks are, doing, are, are starting to come back, according to this, but we don't see any evidence that we're going to come back. What, what can you tell the people in neighborhoods across this country that they should go ahead and put trillions of dollars of their money at risk when we are reading these reports that, they could, that it looks like huge losses are in the offing under the best of circumstances? Why aren't we taking a controlling interest in mortgage-backed securities and the government directing loan modifications instead of, to, to lower principal, lower interest, instead of leaving it up? to uh, people who are still freezing credit here in the States while they are shipping uh, jobs and money overseas. This, to me, is a textbook definition of, of political insanity. And I would just like, you know, do you ever think about these things, about the, the, the inherent contradictions that are in this, about how, you know, Wall Street might have one view of the world, but, uh, but the rest of America is uh, uh, just beset with all these problems as a result of Wall Street? Thank you, Chairman. I think about these things all the time. And let me, you asked a, a very important but complex question, so please permit me to give a thorough answer to your question. First, let's talk about the foreclosure piece. You know, the administration has now come out with what I think is a very good loan modification program, a $75 billion program to encourage servicers and lenders to make long-term sustainable loan modifications. That program is getting up and running right now. We have teams of people reporting to me that are working on implementing that right now. We feel very good about that. I think that's going to make a, a, an important difference in our com communities, number one. Number two, in terms of the loss estimates, I, I would like to offer uh, my perspective on that. I think we have to segment our different programs because different programs have different classes of risk for the taxpayers. So, for example, the lending initiative that I've spent a lot of time talking about today, which Secretary Geithner wants to take to a trillion dollars, is secured by very high quality collateral. We expect where, where investors are in the first loss, actually there are multiple losses for investors before Treasury's exposed or the taxpayer is exposed. My expectation is the losses on that, on that pro program or the risks on that program are much, much lower than the risks in some of the other things that we've had to do. So I don't think it's, I'm just telling you candidly, I don't think we can take the loss estimate for one program and uh, scale it up and apply it. I don't think it's going to be uh, that, that aggressive. Nonetheless, there are real risks. You know, we're all taxpayers, and none of us like putting our dollars at risk to have to do what we're having to do. 
but the economic consequences for all of us are much, much greater if we don't do these distasteful things that we're having to do, these putting taxpayer dollars at risk, intervening in these markets. We're having to do this. Uh, it's, un it's in our own interest. We need to get through this crisis as quickly as possible so the economy can grow again, so we can create jobs. And then we need to reform our regulatory system so we don't get back here again. Uh, my time's expired. I'd like to go to Mr. Souter. I want to I thank you for your time today, and I wanted to leave you with a couple thoughts. One encouraging thing is all these hearings, which I know have to be frustrated to you, it's amer amazing how much about finance Americans are going to be learning in this process, uh, what risks are. It's like we forgot what risk was. Uh, that in my house, I bought it from a, a local uh, small town bank, Grable Bank. Uh, next thing I knew, I was sending it to Brussels, uh, to Amro Ambro or whatever that company is. Now it goes to a company owned by the Chinese. Uh, if we're not careful here, we'll slam down our own mortgages on our, ourselves. This is this money is all over the place and split and securitized and uh, much more complicated than most of us uh, even think about uh, when we get our uh, home mortgage, which may not even have the name of the company we're paying to. Right. Uh, that um, uh, the transparency question, uh, one is, I know that some banks are nervous about getting in because they're worried that if they get this fund, they're going to uh, get a call from you or somebody that says, we noticed you put satellite radio in your car. Why did you do that? Uh, they're very concerned about the big hand of, of government here because they're watching the micromanaging. What's a fair salary? How do you do this? And what, on the other hand, from the taxpayer perspective, you can hear today a lot of the frustration with transparency. And uh, I think uh, while you need to have your um, uh, private ability, and I'm very worried we're about in the process of potentially destroying private sector capital because of the amount of money that the government's going to be taking, how we're going to micromanage this, the different loan uh, categories. It's, it's a frightening thing. There might be public-private partnerships, but it's a scary time if you're more of a private sector person, partly brought on by the par private sector. But in the transparency question, um, I understand the point here, but even in mark-to-market, -mark there's a deep suspicion that that because the change only occurred in 07, that the reason we can't come back is, is that hedge fund, people who are buying short and long and all this kind of stuff have a chokehold on the system and it's not transparent. And that what would seem logical to a traditional banking system, we can't see what's happening. And that leads to a mistrust because it seems to a hardworking person who gets up in the morning and goes to work and starts a small business and tries to get expansion loan and then the bank calls down and says, we're not going to keep your revolving loan credit there. We're having struggles. Partly is somebody speculating against me and I can't see it. And so one of the advantages of the education process that we're going through is, is that it's also generated a fear that some people are manipulating us. And I think that the demand of transparency is going to overwhelm the desire to be uh, have flexibility in your decisions. Uh, when you touch the government, you get the full scale of the government. And this is very worrisome to many of us. At the same time, I don't know how to do it because even I don't have a lot of trust right now. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Yeah, I, was, I was just sitting here thinking about what um, somebody watching this, whether the American people would, uh, how would they feel about all of this? The, this hearing, the newspapers are running story, by the way, just in case your staff hadn't told you, Cash Carry says that we should stay out of the bank's business of lending. That's, that's the story that's come out of this. That's what's all over the place. And uh, then you've got AI Reuters it just came out with a story an hour ago. I just want to quote from the story. Uh, it says, six months after the United States government stepped in, stepped in and sa saved an insurance giant overwhelmed by derivative losses, AIG continues to bleed red ink. Its stocks and bondholders have been crushed, but one group has suffered almost no damage banks that bought credit protection from AIG financial products. Regulatory filings show that since the Federal Reserve announced 
its rescue of AIG on September 15th, about $50 billion of government money has passed through the company to the banks. Treasury is providing a quote, Treasury is providing a massive wealth transfer from taxpayers to Goldman Sachs and other parties, and it's something that absolutely should be investigated, said Eric Hovey, Hovde, Chief Executive of Hovde Capital Advisors, where he manages financial services focused on hedge funds. Um, and I think the reason why I mention that is it seems like the, the, the banks are coming out of this pretty good. They're getting money, whether they want it or not. They get it. If they don't like your rules, you know what they say? Screw you. We'll give it back. Then we've got you saying we shouldn't meddle in their business. Taxpayers are saying we just want a loan. Then you tell us that you, and, and, and I'm, I'm sure this is, is, important, is, is a good thing, this uh, entity that you're creating to help people get loans and auto loans and, and all of that. But the problem is this. It seems as if we're going, it's, 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 I mean, it seems that we are helping the banks tremendously, but they basically, I mean, and they could be more of a part of the solution to the problem. But I kind of think, maybe whether it's intentional or un unintentional, that we just said to them, you go, guys, we're going to keep on giving you the money, and you do whatever you want. Because the top guy says, Congress, don't, don't, we, we shouldn't be trying to determine who they lend to. They are the decision makers. As President Bush said, the deciders. And the deciders have gotten us into the jam that we're in today. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that I want to go back to that analogy that I gave. You, I, I believe that you all are doing everything in your power. I believe that you lose sleep. I think you're giving it everything. And I think you're very, very competent. I think the whole team is. But I feel like you're going up a hill. But, but, but it's not becoming any easier when, when, the, Bush, the, the, when the, the banks could help us up this hill by having some gravel down there so we could get something so that we could get a, a grip on or something, we get ice. And I don't know whether it's, I, I, sometimes I, I think that the folks on Wall Street operate on a, in a whole different world. I don't know if they even have a clue, a clue about the people who are looking at this right now. I really don't. It's like, you know, when, I, when they say a million dollars, it's like $25 to the folks who are losing their homes. And so I got I to, you, you got to say something to me. You got to do something for me to tell these banks to, to, to help out. I mean, I don't, want, I don't want this hearing, I don't want us to leave this hearing with them saying, thanks. Now we've really got our way. And, it, and it's very, very painful. Uh, you may uh, respond to Mr. Cummings, uh, and then we'll, we'll conclude this round. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman. I share your frustration. Every time I open the paper and I read another story of some shindig somewhere, I just wonder, what are these guys thinking? They're not helping themselves. They're not helping me. They're not helping the Washington or the people, you know, our leaders who are trying to get us through this, they're not helping the American people have confidence. And so I think that there have been many cases of enormous lapses of judgment in some of the actions that the banks have taken. And I also, sir, I don't want to leave you with the wrong impression. My comments about we don't want to micromanage these institutions, I'm talking about the hundreds, maybe thousands of institutions we're investing in, community banks, all around our country who did not create this problem. But we want to encourage them to participate because they're in the best position to step up and increase credit. So that's where my, my comments were directed there. For the institutions, the one-offs that made terrible decisions and they need extraordinary assistance from the federal government 
to prevent them from being destabilized, then we absolutely have obligations and responsibilities to make sure that they run their businesses in a prudent and sound manner and that they can pay back the taxpayers. Again, my two highest priorities are financial stability and paying back the taxpayers. Thank you. I, I thank the gentleman. Um, Mr. Kashgari, you've uh, been here for four rounds of questioning. Uh, we're going to conclude uh, uh, the questioning of, of you. And uh, thank you for giving this committee your time here and giving uh, this country your service. Uh, we know this hasn't been easy for you as a witness, uh, but I think that you've been a good witness in representing uh, the point of view that Treasury has been conducting as policy the uh, difference that we have is, you know, that we have to, this whole hearing has been about challenging the policies, about uh, what we believe is Treasury's failure to monitor the ways in which financial institutions are using taxpayers' funds. And, and I think that, you know, as I uh, conclude and, uh, you know, send you with, with the uh, appreciation of this committee, I, I, one of the things I've seen here, and Mr. Souter uh, brings it up, uh, you know, there, there is a fundamental flaw in government intervention in the markets. I mean, this is, uh, we're, this is why we're here. Uh, the um, um, government's intervening in markets, and it's picking winners and losers. Um, so when the issue came up about micromanaging, uh, you have to remember that Congress has a constitutional obligation for oversight. We're a co-equal branch of government, and uh, we cannot defer to, to Treasury when, when there are trillions of tax dollars at stake. I know, I know you understand that, which is the whole point of this hearing, and that uh, the reason why we're here in the first place is that uh, the banks did not perform their fiduciary responsibilities. So when we want to defer to the banks again, you could understand why we'd have some problems with just letting that go unchallenged and in uh, not insisting that Treasury, as we move forward, has to look at their responsibilities for monitoring the ways in which financial institutions are, are, um, are using these tax fair funds under the Troubled Asset Relief Program. So with that, I just want to say that you have appeared before this subcommittee on two occasions. Uh, you have conducted yourself in a way that I, th I think reflects honor uh, and service to the country. And I want to thank you for your presence here and all, all the members of this committee who I've talked to uh, about your presence here today. While we may take issue with your presentation, uh, we think that you have certainly been an excellent witness for the Department of Treasury. So thank you, Mr. Kashkari. Uh, we are going to uh, proceed. Uh, the first panel is now, uh, with Mr. Kashgari, is now discharged. And uh, we're going to take a five-minute recess, and it's only five minutes, as we get the second panel together. And we're going to combine the second panel and the third panel together without objection. But we're going to take a five-minute recess. Uh, we'll be back in five minutes.